Hola, buenos días. Estamos acá para presentar la segunda parte del seminario interactivo que se inició el 25 de mayo. Eh, hoy tenemos figuras destacadas y tenemos una nueva innovación en este eh, webinar. Aparte de nuestros fellows, vamos a participar con los otros eh, eh, hospitales pediátricos públicos de Capital Federal. Esto no quiere decir que ustedes no pueden volcar todas sus preguntas a, a la audiencia. Los dejo con Perry. Perry, it's all yours now. Thank you, Viviana. Gracias, Cecilia. So Perry now is going to share the screen. Perry va a compartir la pantalla y va a empezar con la charla. It's from Argentina. <coughs> Um, Cecilia, please <laughs> translate the other way. Uh, what do you want? Read, so uh, let's please read in English. Uh, okay, okay. So this is what why Viviana was saying that this is our second time we are meeting, and basically we are having this time is going to be different because we have the opportunity to be incorporating three children's hospitals from Argentina, not only in the Garraham. So it should be really good. So special uh, thanks on our part to uh, Don Russell, Debbie Shemansky, Marcella Sprawl, um, uh, and in the last few uh, couple of days to uh, Jordan Stivers, Travis Winston has done a huge job in trying to organize uh, my way too many slides. And uh, Cecilia is a partner of ours here at Wash University in orthopedic surgery and a native of Buenos Aires and was essential for our first call, and you will realize she is essential for this call. So thank you, everybody. Um, and uh, you want to introduce the uh, introduce the hospitals and the fellows? yeah. So basically, the hospitals that we are going that we have today on the call is El Hospital Garraham, El Gutierrez, y El Hospital Elizalde. And then these are I assume these are fellows. Estos son fellows, Viviana, sí. becarios de Argentina. Son residentes y los nuestros son becarios. Okay, so these are a couple of people that are the resi residents in pediatrics there in, in Argentina. And then they have put here our names, uh, the, the fellows here, Travis, Raj, Craig, Anthony, and Justin. Fellows from uh, North America, some current, and uh, Craig, Anthony, and Justin, recent grads. The fact that these, uh, go ahead, uh, So these are the people from the Garraham, Jaime Candia, Viviana de los Russo, Rodolfo Goyeneche, Sergio Innocenti, and Phil Giacomini. It sounds like Italian, huh? Angie. It does, it does, it does. And uh, North American facts on the call, Baxter from, um, uh, Baxter, you want to say hello? Morning, everyone. Buenos dias. <laughs> Ira. Good morning, everybody. John. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Gordon. Eric. Eric had to step out for the first couple of minutes. Okay. And we especially recognize uh, Horatio Missioni, the past director of the uh, Garahan Hospital in Buenos Aires, who uh, originally years ago uh, reached out to Eric and I to come to Buenos Aires uh, with some of our other trips in that part of the world and has been a tremendous, gracious, encouraging person to us. And a long-term uh, friend of everybody's in pediatric orthopedic surgery, particularly in the hips, with tremendous knowledge. Uh, and I don't know if he's on or not. Uh, he's living in Taiwan. He also lives in Chicago. It's eight o'clock at night there, but I told him to drink some coffee and stay up. Ken, are you on the call? Horacio, are you on the call? 
Okay, recognition of these wonderful people. So read the, uh, could you go through this in English? Uh, yes, so we will, with the, the things that we are going to discuss today is about the, the role of ultrasound, um, close reduction, uh, open reduction, um, and then open reduction in small kids, uh, residual dysplasia, and then treatment in patients older or young adult, and the young adult kid basically. We got uh, into um, the, the bullet number three last time, just started and to catch up and make everybody on the same page, we'll go back a little bit to close reduction and then go mostly, uh, then finish open reduction and then as time allows, go into residual dysplasia. So just to review and to kind of make sure we're all together, uh, we um, kind of, I think, look at DDH's birth to six months, we should think of splinting Seven to 18 months, we should think of close reduction. More than 18 months, open reduction is preferred generally. Uh, so Noelia Gonzalez, would you agree with this? Noelia, ¿te parece que ustedes hacen el mismo plan de tratamiento allá? Is Noelia on the call? Lucas Fernandez. Lucas? Eh, Viviana, ¿le dan, ¿le dan micrófono a, lo, a los fellows ahí? Perdón, las personas que quieran Lucas. hablar, por favor, que levanten la mano, porque así los puede habilitar el mic. Ahí está Noelia, ya habilitada. Ahí, ahí está, ¿se escucha? Sí. Hola, buen día. Buen sí, día. nosotros usamos el mismo tratamiento, la misma línea de tratamiento. Okay. So the same, very. Say what? Pardon? It's same like we do. They agree with the plan of treatment. They agree. Okay. All right. They agree. Okay. So we agree with that. We agree with that. And of course, there's overlap between when we do a pelvic and when we do a, a close reduction. Sometimes you can have a nine, <laughs> ten month old child with an Orlani positive hip in the clinic, and you can probably try a pelvic harness. And sometimes we do closed reductions later. Sometimes we do open reductions earlier. So there's overlap. Uh, would this be sort of the way you see uh, um, the, the treatment of this, um, Bibiana? Bibiana, estás ahí? Acá estoy. Habilité el... So, uh, tienen el mismo plan, ¿no? Ustedes, que a veces se, se puede ser que se, a pesar de que lo pongan bien en grupos, igual a veces se mezcla un poco, ¿no? Sí, nuestro límite para la reducción cerrada es los 18 meses. Hasta ahí, y después no, no tratamos más. So, the same, Perry, till 18 months, around 18 months, and then close reduction, and then they will start doing the open reduction. And Eric and I work together, so this is kind of our protocol. Uh, John Schenecker, is this roughly what you look at treatment options and how they overlap? Yeah, absolutely. I think that the uh, 18 months aspect of it, I'm, I'm definitely going to be really paying close attention to the child who's over a year uh, if I'm doing a close reduction to make sure it's not too tight. Um, I think that that's where you really start having to think much more about um, soft tissue balancing and making absolutely certain that that femur is uh, not causing the reduction to be too tight. So I think that 18 months, I wouldn't go into that, you know, too, without paying really close attention to that part of the exam. Ira? Um, <clears throat> I agree. I think that there is overlap and the issues for overlap for me are the soft tissue balance, as John mentioned, and the other thing is just a general sense of the maturity of the hip, because I think what we're really managing here is, is the capacity of the hip to remodel. So I, I will tend towards doing a closed reduction even later on if the soft tissues are compliant and if the acetabulum is pretty immature. C Cecilia, can you, uh, I know your mind works wonders. Can you put that together and summarize what the two gentlemen just said in Spanish? Sí, so el, 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 lo que están diciendo del overlap básicamente es lo que ellos consideran mucho es el soft tissue y de acuerdo a eso puede ser que estiren un poco más o no el close reduction. Baxter Willis uh, and I met, I think, in 19, 
77 and uh, 76, 77. And Dr. Salter was in Toronto and Baxter was doing a fellowship there and I visited. And at that time in the late 70s, it was pretty much rigid thinking that anybody over 15 or 16 or 17 months must have an open reduction. And if you're over 18 months, this is thinking almost 45 years ago, if you had an open reduction at 18 months, you must have a pelvic osteotomy. You were taught that as a fellow, Baxter, um, decades later, what do you feel about that and what this diagram says? Well, I think we know a lot more now about uh, remodeling on both the femoral and acetabular side, but I think this speaks to the importance of a very careful physical examination at the time of a closed reduction to assess, as John has said, is it tight or not? Is the uh, reduction stable? Uh, but we don't need to be as dogmatic as we were 45 or 50 years ago. Cecilia, can you summarize Dr. Willis's comments? Esto, básicamente, el, el tema de cuán tight, cuán, cuán stiff está esa cadera o no, es lo que te va a hacer decidir si vos puedes quedarte con una reducción cerrada o vas a tener que abrir la cadera. So, let's look at a couple cases and see if these are good cases for, let's say, close reduction. So, uh, Juan Pablo Gulli, are you on the call? So this is a five months old. We tried a pelvic harness, but uh, we failed. Um, I would say this x-ray, we have to use, I'm sorry, the white highlights to show the anatomy uh, for discussion. The left hip is okay. It's The right hip is our problem hip. Would this be something uh, you would think would be a closed reduction, a good idea or not? Sí, sí, me parece que es posible intentar una, una reducción cerrada. Okay, I think everybody probably, probably agree. Um, uh, and um, we'd say yes. So here we have uh, one, a 10-month-old, uh, no previous treatment. And the other side is, as it is, subluxated or dislocated. Uh, what about uh, your thoughts here about your first treatment approach, Juan. Y yo creo que acá también se podría intentar una, una reducción cerrada. Same very close reduction. Okay, anybody disagree anytime, just speak in, close reduction possible for sure, yes, okay. Uh, okay, um, Barbie Castro, are you on? How about Boris Perez? These are all fellows from uh, Buenos Aires. Boris, Perez? Boris or Barbie está llamando. How about Noelia Gonzalez? Lu Lucas Fernandez? I'm sorry, Perry. Están todos chicos, se pueden sacar el día. Los están habilitados para hablar. Buenos días. Lucas, habla, dale, dale, así le seguimos. Lo, lo que creo que en esta cadera podría, es posible una, una reducción cerrada, pero habría que ir con, una, con un segundo plan que en caso de no reducirse habría que hacer una reducción abierta. So he said he, he, will, he will do plan, plan A will be close reduction, but he will have a plan B ready to open the hip. Uh, okay, uh, Rodolfo, uh, you agree? Rodolfo Goshenecki, you agree try a close reduction or not? <coughs> Hola, ¿se escucha? Sí. Sí. sí, sí, sí. Sí, sí, estoy totalmente de acuerdo. Intentar la reducción cerrada. Si tenemos dudas, hacemos una artrografía y si consideramos necesario, una reducción abierta, una tenotomía de doctores. So the same, he will try a close reduction. He will also think about using an artrogram to confirm the reduction. And if it's not good, he will start doing soft tissue release. Boris, tenés un habilitado, podés hablar. Okay, good. 
So we'll, we'll, I know Boris had his hand up for question, but we keep moving on. So here's a four months old, and we'll go now to uh, Beck, um, how about Antonella Fugoreras? Is Antonella on the call? Yes. Four, good. Four months old, uh, have a carnist, bilateral hips are dislocated. Child got uh, some sickness and uh, thriving problems and came back at a year old. Small child. So we all talk the same thing. Both hips are very dislocated. Femoral heads are not ossified. Um, small child. What would you think uh, about the, as a candidate for close reduction? Eh, creo que, aunque por la edad se podría intentar una reducción cerrada, las caderas están muy altas y mm, probablemente la zona cartilaginosa que no se ve en la radiografía, si uno intenta una reducción cerrada, quedaría muy, muy a tensión. Así que iría con una reducción abierta. Dice que está bastante dislocada, así que probablemente estará preocupada por el cartilage, así que intentará abrirlo. I would concur. Deborah Eastwood from United Kingdom at the Great Ormond Street Hospital has a recent publication or looked up their experience. They have a lot of experience in London at that hospital with DDH. And uh, I talked on the phone about this particular type case a couple of months ago. When they looked up many cases like this, there was a very high failure rate, at least for one of the two hips and there were a lot of problems of redislocation. And so I think when it's this proximal, and maybe as what John and Ira were talking about, when the soft tissues are getting this tight, I think by any reduction done closed, even with a medial assist, your risk for failure and complications with redislocation AVN are high. So I would say, I would not try this with closed, closed redu reduction. Uh, your thoughts, Eric? Gordon, are you back on, Eric? Eric's tied up the first. John Schenecker? I completely agree. I like what Ira said earlier about essentially judging the maturity, if you will, of the hip. And if you look at this at one year, for sure, this is a very immature hip, meaning that either the biomechanics or the vascularity to the epiphysis is not normal and the risk of adding to that proximal femoral growth disturbance by doing anything other than having a perfect reduction on this, I think has a very big risk of a bad outcome. And with that in mind, I think it's a much safer for the maturity of the hip to do an open reduction. Uh, a very experienced senior surgeon uh, down in Buenos Aires who I admire a lot, Jaime Candia. When, in, when you were practicing, maybe you still are, what would you think the best approach for this? You've had lots of years of experience. Can you say that in Spanish, Cecilia? Because I don't speak, he's think he speaks English. Sí, so, recuerdo su experiencia, ¿cómo trataría este paciente? Eh, hay que habilitarla a Jaime Candia, si está... Está habilitado. Por otro lado, el doctor Juan Pablo Albarracín pide no. hablar con Perry. No sé si quieres comentar. La pregunta era para Jaime, no para mí. ¿eh? La pregunta era para Perry. Si ha visto pacientes de un año con ortorrhinic positivo. Perry, John Ecker, good morning. I would like to ask you if, if you have seen a patient with uh, DDH and ortorrhinic positive at one year old. Have I seen a patient with DDH? I, I didn't understand sincerely what he asked. Oh, if, if, you, if you have ever seen a patient with one year old with an ortolanic positive. So you can do the reduction without problem. I've seen a patient 22 months old with positive Ortolani, a normal child in the clinic. Wow. Child, this child here would be very definitely Ortolani negative, this child. Can you answer that, Cecilia? Yes, I think he understood. Okay, I didn't get Candia's answer, I understood, but I'm gonna move on. So one of the things I think that I have struggled with over the years and you learn, 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 uh, is the position of immobilization in these small children is really, really important. So, um, Juan Pablo Gulli, are you there? Yeah, okay. So the right hip is 
located, the left hip is dislocated and the femoral heads are not ossified. And this was a child who had been in pavlic harness for a long time and nothing good happened. And would you agree, Juan, we try close reduction? Sí, sí, yep. sí, de acuerdo. So yes. put the child to sleep and you see a terrible x-ray and <laughs> say this is awful, but this is sometimes the best you get, particularly when you copy for a presentation. So you use your imagination and you draw where the proximal femurs are and you put the heads on and you got that and you got this. Can you ask, go through that, Cecilia, and ask a question? Levanta la mano. Donde dice levanta la mano, así ella te abre el micrófono. So, lo que dice Perry acá es que intenta la reducción cerrada en el quirófano y obtienen estas radiografías. Sí, me parece que están más reducidas. Sorry? En buena posición. Ok. So, he, he believes that these are good, like they are nicely reduced. It is nicely reduced the last side, yeah. Okay, yes, heads are medial to Perkins lines and below the H. Hilgenreiner's line. Um, can you say that, Cecilia? También reducidas están adentro de la Hilgen line, below the Hilgen line and medial at Perkins line. Um, and with our North American faculty concur, the left hip is not quite as good as the right, but there are little differences in rotation of the pelvis. So, la, la izquierda quizás no se ve tan bien, pero también si ven la radiografía, en serio está rotada la pelvis. Por eso es que no se ve tan bien. O sea que el tema de la, la rotación de la pelvis es importante. Looks good, Perry. And so we say, aha, we like this. The stability felt good. It was not excessively tight, which to me is the most critical part. The feel of the reduction is huge. Okay, so we put in a cast. And sometimes when you take the little bitty child, you know, 12 pounds, 11 pounds, and you put them in a cast, it's an unbelievable kind of too many hands everywhere. So I think I may have been actually holding, but no, I, maybe I was holding the legs, somebody putting the cast on. And so this is the cast on, and here's the picture. Um, and what do you think now, Juan? Could you ask him that, unless he understood me, Cecilia? Juan, así se ve después de que le pusieron el yeso. ¿Te gusta? Eh, no. No, ahí se ve que está afuera la cadera. Yeah, Están rotaciones. Uh, no dislocated. Sorry. Not so what, what position would you pick, Juan, if you were going to hold the legs of this five-month-old child? as they put the cast on. What would you do about flexion, rotation, and abduction? ¿Cómo pondrías la pierna para que se mantenga una buena reducción? La cadera. Sí, la, la posición del pelipédico post reducción es eh, con la cadera en flexión, este, abducción y rotación interna. Flexion, abduction, and internal rotation. I, I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, recently, in a couple of cases, actually, John Schenecker talked to me over the phone. It's coming back in my brain again about the importance of internal rotation. And um, internal rotation, so essential. Uh, I, for, I forget, oh, no, I forget it. Internal rotation is so essential because they have a relatively excessive antiversion. And I think if you look on the picture on the right where we say is it reduced, the leg is externally rotated. Uh -huh. El problema es usted, lo más importante es la rotación interna, porque tienen tanta anteversión femoral que tenés que hacer la rotación interna del fémur. Y ustedes ven, cuando hicieron el cast acá, está en rotación externa ese fémur. Por eso no se redujo. So you see what this is going on, and Juan doesn't like the reduction. So uh, Boris Perez, what should we do now? Patient's still asleep. Boris Perez. Buen día, doctor. Pero, eh, ¿Me so, puedes repetir, por favor, la pregunta? No, no yeah, lo ahora, muy... supongamos que estás en el quirófano, le pusiste el yeso y te quedó así. ¿Qué harías ahora? Pero, eh, en primera instancia, po podría probar eh, la estabilidad de la cadera, dándole, como dicen, la rotación interna, pero si tuviera un... si podría realizar una artrografía para ver y posicionarme bien en la, eh, y ver dónde queda la cabeza, me ayudaría mucho más. 
So he would like to do an art program and see really where's the femoral head. Not available, but very stable. We took the cast off and I tried reduction again. And this time I had internal rotation and I came down in a little abduction from flexion. And I had a very stable feeling when the leg was internally rotated, but no, okay. arthrogram, no arthrogram available. What do you want to do, Boris? No hay artrograma, dice que le sacó el yeso, la volvió, hizo rotación interna y ahora está muy estable adentro de la cadera. Ok, eh, sí, la rotación interna con la reducción de las caderas, pero la pregunta es, dentro de quirófano, es, además de los rayos X, la otra posibilidad también que tendríamos sería la ecografía. Mi pregunta es si dentro de quirófano le hacen algún control ecográfico antes de colocarle el yeso. I did say I didn't hear what I didn't understand you, Cecilia. He's wondering if you use an ultrasound intraoperative to confirm the reduction. No. No. Okay, let's go on. So we should immobilize, as I think uh, Juan said. This I think is critical. And uh, was it not Dr. Salter Baxter who came up with this human position of reduction? Yeah, he, he talked about that rather than so much abduction, the frog position is verboten. It's not to be used. Yeah. Flexion, the human position, less than 60 degrees abduction and internal rotation. And that's all I did here differently. And here is, again, unsatisfactory reduction, as I think Juan told us. I changed the cast, Boris. Now what do you think, Boris? Boris, ahora le hizo, le volvió a reposicionar la pierna, le vuelve a poner el cast y ahora hace esa aerografía. Si te preguntas si qué más hace eso te gusta. Eh, las imágenes me, sí, pareciera ya reducida la cadera. Lo que me genera duda es cómo controlan a nivel posterior, si no se está luxada a nivel posterior la cadera. Mm. Pero me, si fuera por esta placa de rayos X, sí, eh, pareciera mm, que estuviera en posición. So it seems like it, it actually looks very good, but he's asking about how do you know it's not dislocated posteriorly. Sergio uh, Innocente, do you use, uh, to answer Boris's question, do you, do you use other imaging now to look at posterior and anterior placement of the head? Could you say that, Cecilia? Do, you, do they, what is 3D imaging does Innocent, uh, Sergio or uh, Rodolfo use, either one, for checking uh, reduction now posterior and anterior, CT or MRI or no? ¿Usan algún tipo de otras imágenes para confirmar que no está luxada en el plano antero o posterior? También eh, podríamos utilizar la tomografía para determinar si esta está en el plano antero o posterior, si esta se, se encuentra luxada. Sí, sí, eh, Perry. Uh, Ira, do you do uh, any ultrasounds in the OR or MRI in your OR or CT for this? No, es para, es para Ira, Ira, do you use CT, MRI, ultrasound? We, we, use, we use arthrography. Um, and afterwards, I typically will get an MRI scan uh, to look at the placement of the femoral epiphysis in the acetabulum. So, usan un, un arthrograma y un MRI post para ver cómo está la epiphysis. <coughs> Does anybody here get MRIs in the OR? We, we don't have that capability. Um, no, in Argentina no tenemos en quirófano. Eh, Post-operative, Perry, we, of course, we don't have in, to do it in quirófano. Cecilia, cuando puedas, hay dos preguntas para hacer. Una de Matt Miller. Hey, Perry. Can I translate that? 
Talia, si querías hacer un comentario. Hola. So, one thing, eh, los que no hablen, cierren el micrófono, así no tenemos eco. Perry, so we have a question from Mark Miller. The, the five-year-month-old you presented with unilateral dislocation, who has a failed public, what is the role of a more rigid abduction bracing like an Ilfeld or Eilfeld? Um, we, 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 to, to answer that question, which is kind of not in the program today, but to answer that question is, Uh, in this particular case, we tried that and it was totally unsuccessful. The hip was just not locatable at all. Uh, it gets into a whole other discussion, but uh, if you need some more um, abduction uh, in the safe way, uh, either an Ilfeld or I don't use a rhino brace is possible. I've also learned to reverse the straps on the pelvic harness to again affect internal rotation the posterior straps comes anteriorly, and if you put into rotation on the pavlik, <coughs> amazing how much better the pavlik is. Can you answer that way? Sí, so en este caso no funcionó. Puedes usar un Ilfeld, pero él también lo que ha usado con el pavlik es eh, cambiar las, las straps, las que van posterior las pone anterior, y eso también puede funcionar. Um, to address a question that Ira mentioned about arthrography, we talked about that on the previous call, and Mm -hmm. I've had at least three, two or three times in my life where I put maybe too much fluid in on an MRI, on, uh, excuse me, on the arthrogram from this size patient, and I made my instability worse. Mm -hmm. I've never experienced it on a 13 or 14 month old child. So on somebody under six months, I go entirely by without an arthrography because of that happening. And I know it's happened to Eric, my partner. Uh, I know, Ira, you like the, uh, John or Schoeniger or Baxter Willis. I know, Baxter, I think you like, how about John, your thoughts about arthrogram in this age? Yeah, I mean, I, I like the arthrogram a lot. I do agree you have to be careful about how much you put in. Um, I think it's also pretty easy to get it out as well. Um, if you need it for diagnostic purposes and then need to pull it off, I think that that's not too difficult to do. I think in this case here, the failure was truly in the positioning of the first cast, whether you had had an arthrogram or not, the cast was put on with extra rotation of the leg and not enough flexion. And you can see the big improvement just by changing the cast. If you had had dye in there, you would have, I would have just further confirmed that. I think that's my point of this presentation. And it's not like I learned this 35 years ago. I just recently did this case a few months ago. Go ahead, Cecilia. So no, vuelvo a, vuelvo a enfatizar lo importante que es la posición de la cadera para mantener la reducción. Y después otra cosa que le habíamos hablado la vez pasada es lo del artrograma, que si vos se la haces a un paciente que tiene seis meses, a un bebé de seis meses, tenés muchas chances de generar la, la dislocación. Entonces hay que tener mucho cuidado de usar artrogramas en los seis meses, en los pacientes de seis meses. Cecilia, acá hay una pregunta muy interesante desde México en donde dice, si esta cadera fue una falla de arnés, probablemente tenga defecto de la pared posterior, ¿y qué recaudos tomaría en ese caso? So, um, this is a question coming from Mexico asking if, if it was a failure of the public, uh, is there a chance that there's a failure of the posterior column? Is that right, Viviana? La columna posterior. La columna posterior, de la pared posterior. Yeah, del posture, the posture column. Insufficiencia? Viviana? La está en una. I think you ask, is there a failure of the posture column? It has a disease of the posture column. Okay, I, I think if the public fails, it's a combination of. An anatomical abnormality that you can't safely overcome with forced abduction, as Ira and John talked about before, if the soft tissues are tight and you have an unossified femoral head and you try to abduct, which is what we do to stabilize any hip, adult or child, you run the risk, a huge risk of a circulation problem or deformation of significance to the proximal femur. So I think 
the problem really is a combination of too much soft tissue contracture, adductor type, psoas type, and too much anatomical abnormality to let you get by safely with a closed reduction. So, él piensa que en serio es una combinación de dos problemas. Una es el soft tissue, que tenés muy, muy tenso lo que son los aductores. Entonces, obviamente, que si tenés tenso la parte de soft tissues es muy difícil reducirla. Y por el otro lado, que tenés una cadera displásica. Entonces, es la combinación de las dos cosas. Y por eso ellos enfatizan que tenés que sentir la cadera, cuánto es chief está o no. The next case for further bring that point across, Cecilia. Sí, reducción cerrada y necrosis vascular secundaria. Four months old, both hips dislocated, to the OR. There's our attempted close reduction. What do you see, Barbie Castro? Right hip, left hip, both satisfactory reduced, not good reduced. Are you on the line, Barbie? ¿Me puede repetir? Sí, ahí se dice, si, paciente de cuatro meses le hace la, la reducción cerrada, si te parece que las caderas están normales. ¿Es la pregunta? Sí. She thinks they're both satisfactory reduced. ¿Te parece que las dos caderas están reducidas? Sí. Yes. Look at look at Hilgen Reiner's line, which you know whether you have an arthrogram or not. The left hip is not satisfactorily reduced. It's it's too lateral and too proximal. And if you keep pushing, you might be able to seat it better. But that becomes risky to tight soft tissues and and changes of circulation in the proximal femur. Si vos, ves bien, si vos ves bien y la comparás con la derecha, la izquierda no está muy reducida. Y si seguís empujando, tenés el gran riesgo de producir una necrosis avascular secundaria. I would suggest that the left hip is about this much bone. Not much, it's all cartilage as we see here. Es la cantidad de cartílago que tienes, prácticamente todo cartílago. And the instructions in orthopedics 60 years ago in the textbooks were this position because it stabilized the hips as we see here this frog abducted position claro que si ves la, la, los pictures la, la, de, de, de libros viejos vas a ver la, cómo los abducían porque obviamente que hace una cadera estable pero esto es muy peligroso abducirla en, so, so, de tanto tanto es demasiada. And we think we must obtain a reduction of this hip, so we try harder and harder, but we inadvertently abduct more and more when we do that. Claro. No tenés que seguir tratando de abducir, 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 porque le haces una necrosis. And I think the mistake is, you know, marginally stable, can we redislocate? Even if we have an arthrogram, we can push the hip too far. We think it should work. And we get too abducted in the cast, or we try too hard with the cast, and you have circulation issues here at, at, at this age, which are a, a concern. At this age, John Schenecker, is there much blood flow here? Is this what, what's keeping this thing alive? Well, the cartilage itself um, lives very well in an avascular setting. They're at, looking at there, you probably already have some capillaries coming in to form that ossific nucleus. Um, but it's a very plastic, uh, deformable cartilage on log. And so a lot of pressure on that can occlude those capillaries. So um, the main thing to avoid is surgically not hitting them and not to put pressure, too much pressure on that. Epiphany. So let's see, I think, um, so Noelle, is Noelle on? Noeli Gonzalez? Noelia? Yeah, you see? So there's six months post fail we failed probably and we've had three casts. So we've tried really hard. I mean really, really hard. And the point is, even if you don't think you you know got a frog position, you just push too hard, I think, sometimes. So the patient comes back at 15 months and you're very concerned. How does the right hip look? developing up here 
Dr. Gonzalez. ¿Cómo te parece que se está desarrollando la cadera derecha? What about the left la, hip? La, la izquierda. Perry, the left one, ¿ah? Huh? You want to know or the right one? The right one. Both. Both. Compararlas en la, las dos y decinos qué te parece. La cadera derecha tiene un buen desarrollo, por lo menos es una cadera que está eh, congruente, y la cadera izquierda muestra signos de necrosis en la metáfisis y en la epífisis. So the right one looks very good and the left one it shows uh, early signs of AVN. Dr. Justin Roth, are you on? Perdón, no entendí la pregunta. No, es para otro doctor. Travis Winston? Craig Smith? Raj? Where are the Americans? One more, Anthony Silverio. We must say that strike one, two, three, four, five for the North Americans. <laughs> okay, so um, who was Noelle? So what? Tell me why. What's wrong with the development? What do you? What does it look like uh, in the proximal femur? What do you? I mean, does it look like Perthes almost, right? ¿De cómo se ve el próximo al femur de, de la cadera izquierda? Dice, parece casi como un Perthes, ¿no? Exactamente. Yes, that is correct, Mary. What should we do, Noelle? ¿Qué hacemos? Uh, Como está la cadera así, le esperaría. Vería cómo if, it, if, if anything. We will wait, Perry. Smarto, smarto, so smart. <laughs> uh, and uh, at this time there was debate. I'm sorry, about... Travis is here. He just needs to unmute himself. Who's that? Travis, Travis Winston. Travis is fine. We, I think we should continue. But we can it's ask it's Travis. It's in it's okay. So the recommendation was either watch or do an open reduction. And Noelle very smartly answered, wait, wait, wait. Have you seen cases like this, Noelle Gonzalez? That's a very smart answer you gave us, I think. Dice que es una, una respuesta excelente, que si te preguntas si viste casos así allá. Sí, sí hay. Yes, any. Yes, and this is, here we are at the young age, six years, so we've lost a lot of growth. We've got deformity. We have some congruency, but a big problem to push these hips too much. It's really got to respect the soft tissues. Can you summarize that, Cecilia? Eh, lo más importante es que siempre tenés que respetar el, el soft tissue en estos pacientes, porque si no, ese es el problema. Remember, in the first six years of life, the proximal femoral growth plate for length is just about as important as the distal femoral growth plate in the first six years of life. So how much leg length and equality do you think they'll be at uh, 14 years of age just from this injury, Noella, Noelia Gonzalez? Oh, Noel, ¿cómo pensás que va a haber la discrepancia de miembros en longitud cuando este paciente tenga 14 años? Va a tener un acortamiento de ese miembro. Yeah, it will be short, shorter, of course. Six centimeters. Okay. Six centimeters. Okay, helpful. MRIs. Yes, I like MRIs a lot afterwards. So um, let's see. Uh, Travis, you're on, correct? Winston? Yeah, actually, he just texted me that his computer does not have a microphone. Oh, not good. Oh, that cuts him out. Raj? Right here, I'm right behind you. Oh, here's Travis. Okay, Travis. Okay, oh. Travis. Hi, Travis. Here's Travis. So, Travis. Um, we had eight months old, left hip Ortolani negative in the clinic. What do you want to do? Eight months old, Ortolani negative in the clinic. We need to have another view to see if uh, we can reduce it all and check the abduction. Okay, there's your, there's Ortolani positive in the OR and there's your abduction. What should we do next? Uh, Ortolani positive in the OR with good abduction. Uh, sorry, sir. Cool. What do you want to do? Uh, we can get an x-ray, see if it's safe at that standpoint. We can evaluate the tightness of the adductors. Keep going. Uh, we can try to do a closed reduction. And then an adductor tenotomy. Arthrogram? Arthrogram. Cecilia, can you summarize that? Sí, so él dice que hay que hacer, le haces un arthrograma, probablemente tenotomía de los aductores. Reducción cerrada, of course. Baxter, uh, 
would you pretty much consider this going to be a closed reduction or a medium approach, or what would you think? Uh, you've got a somewhat restricted safe zone, but it uh, has a nice uh, stability feel within that safe zone. Would you concur with what Travis suggested? Yes, if, if you can do this safely with less than 60 degrees of abduction, uh, I'm a little concerned that it's up to 50, but an adductor tenotomy and arthrogram, and, and very important, the feel of your reduction at the time of closed reduction. Uh, Ira, adductor tenotomy then, arthrogram, arthrogram first, uh, major approach, how do you procedure technically, Ira? So I, I would do a, an arthrogram with a very, very minute amount of dye, uh, more just to add, adsorb to the surface so I can see where the head is. And then for me, it's a feel. Uh, the number of degrees is not really um, as important as how loose the hip feels. And I would add an adductor tenotomy and proceed with subsequent soft tissue releases depending upon the feel of the reduction. There's the arthrogram we're looking for. What do you think? Well, it doesn't look like it's, uh, there's a fair amount of dye in there. And to me, it doesn't look like the epiphysis is seated into the base of the acetabulum. Uh, what should we do next? Should we do that? So I personally would not be satisfied with that reduction. And I look at uh, doing soft tissue releases on a continuum in this age. So the first thing I would do would be an adductor tenotomy. And if I was unsatisfied, then I would proceed through the steps of a medial open reduction via a Ludloff, a Ludloff approach. And I'm Absolutely. allowing my feel and my arthrogram to guide me along the way. And Absolutely. sometimes I only do the psoas and sometimes I may have to open the capsule and, and address intraarticular structures. So just depending upon how things evolve during the procedure is what I do. Felt much better after the adductor tenotomy. Then what should we do? So if I'm, if you're happy, if you got a nice loose uh, reduction and you're not uh, feeling like you're applying too much stress to the soft tissues, then I would apply a cast. Cecilia, can you summarize? Can you hear me now? Yes. So lo que dice el doctor Aira es que él básicamente eh, va viendo, hace un artrograma con muy poquito contraste y después va viendo cómo se va sintiendo la cadera y va haciéndolo progresivamente. Entonces empieza con una tenotomía de aductores y si no está convencido todavía porque no está blue, sino que todavía está tight, después quizás hace una, una release del psoas y así va secuentemente, pero es más que nada sintiendo cómo está la cadera y de acuerdo a eso va decidiendo lo plan, los puntos, cómo va progresando en in their release. Juan Pablo, there's our MRI after we put our spike and cast on. Juan Pablo, ¿te gusta el MRI? ¿Cómo se ve la cadera? The blue arrow is pointing at what, Juan Pablo Goulet? Okay, I'll give you another clue. Are you there, Juan? Hola, sí. ¿Cómo ves la MRI ahí? ¿Te parece que está reducida o que está subluxada todavía? No, no, todavía está subluxada, está luxada posterior. Yes. And we were surprised because we thought this felt pretty good. And uh, after the concern of the arthrogram, the adductor tenotomy made this hip feel much better. And, this, and we got this MRI. So what should we do now? We, we looked at this and we all looked at, uh, at each other with kind of disappointment and surprise. So what do we do next? Ask that, Cecilia. ¿Qué vamos a hacer ahora? Eh, yo haría este, un cambio de yeso, hacer un yeso nuevo. A new cast, Perry. Now what do you think? Ahora, ah. ahora, ahora sí está reducido. Now it's nice. Yeah, and good. So I, I think you see this and you should see it soon and you should make some decisions. If you think your reduction was very precarious to begin with, when you see what's in the red circle with the MRI and the patient's awake 10 hours later, you might say, you know, I don't think we can get this any better. But the feeling was this hip's better than that. 
So going to the OR right away or the next day, take the cast off, go back, and um, in a much better situation. Uh, would you concur, Eric? Yeah, okay. I would. I mean, but I think you really need to critically look at what you're doing and not just force it into more abduction. If, if this is really the best cast you can get and the most abduction you can get, sometimes bailing and coming back another day for a, a formal open reduction is a better choice. Totally concur. And if, again, think of what your abduction, think of what your flexion is and where your rotation is. I really think rotation is a big part of it. John Scheniger, your thoughts on positioning and dealing with this issue when it arises? Yeah, I completely agree. Is, is that um, this is where having potentially ultrasound in the operating room or having a little bit of dye in the joint, like uh, Ira was saying, I think can be very helpful and really taking your time to pay attention to that position before you get into um, a casting situation is really important. And, you know, it's nice that you have the AP view here, but I think you can use the C arm to get other views to see that posterior component. Um, you can't see it on the view that you have right there. And so I think that's where it's really important to just pay attention to the diff different positions that you can look at it with that arthrogram as well. Lateral. Uh, the safe zone is a little limited. Can you summarize that, Cecilia? Sí, Joel, cuando hace la reducción, ve que la distancia de la cabeza femoral derecha está un poquito más lateral, por eso la distancia es mayor que la izquierda. Uh, so let's say the arthrogram showed us a little bit of extra joint space. Meet the dipole was a little too wide. Um, and uh, how would you uh, proceed at this time? I think we give this back to Ira. So um, again, in the operating room, I'm concerned about uh, lateral displacement. I need to sequentially address the potential structural causes. So is it soft tissue uh, tightness? I'd proceed with an adductor tenotomy. I'd then move to a psoas tenotomy. And finally, I would do a medial open reduction at this age and uh, address intraarticular structures in order to get the, the epiphysis seated properly within the acetabulum. Similar approaches done at uh, in Buenos Aires, uh, Bibiana, as far as you know. Meet, meet your approach. Cecilia. Similar approaches, uh, medial approach done in bonus arrays. Uh, for the the Diana's in the same medial approach there. Exacto. Sí. Yes, Barry. Uh, John Chenneker, how do you like to get there? This is one way. This goes under the pectine pectineus, the adductor longus has been uh, weakened here a little bit. Is this your approach, sir? Yes. How do you protect the vessels, John? I usually Doppler out uh, the vessels and um, in particular, I think the main time you need to protect them is when you're working back and forth between working on the iliopsoas and working um, intracapsular. And I think that's where you have to make sure you don't just sweep from the lesser trochanter up to the uh, capsule. You have to come back out and go through a different window as you move up more proximally. Interestingly, when I was a young staff man, believe it or not, there are papers published in which reputable North American pediatric orthopedic surgeons said, bovi all the vessels, it makes no difference experimentally in the animal, so it won't make any difference in the human. Can you say that, Cecilia? That's wrong information, but that was published 40 years ago. So, está hablando de que se publicó 40 años atrás, se publicaba y se decía que no, no había que no importaba que directamente podías hacer el, la electrocautorización de, lo que, de los vasos que estén ahí, obviamente, ¿no? Pero eso era and lo que with, decía 40 años atrás. And when this approach got sort of rediscovered in the mid-70s by a man named Ferguson in Pittsburgh, for about 10 years, many of these were done, and with an AVN rate, significant AVN rate, as close as 60%. And finally, then people began to realize you got to do this in a safe way. Say that, Cecilia. So, que antes, cuando se hacía así, se electrocautrizaba todo, el, el, la incidencia de necrosis era el 60%. And they're still done. Uh, uh, late, oh, the guy from um, 
Australia who just died. Oh, help me, guys. Uh, they're still done a lot of places. Ian with, Tarot. Yeah, Ian Tarot, right. Ian Tarot. Yes. One, they still done a lot of places, and they will accept. Ian did these, and he anticipated a type 2 AVN in many cases. Sometimes it was a long neck development, but he anticipated that. So I, so I think when you do this, you have to be very careful of the vessels. Can you summarize that, Cecilia? Y bueno, que obviamente cuando haces esto tenés que tener, y lo que decía John antes, de usa, ellos usan Doppler, porque es importantísimo no lesionar los vasos porque la incidencia de necrosis es altísima. I did a lot of dog experiments when I was much younger in the lab, and if you have young dogs with dislocatable hips, and you do this approach, it's so much easier to do the approach if the hip can be reduced, like we see here, because you can feel where you're going. If you have a high riding dislocation that you can't reduce, I think it's, from my hands, tricky to do this approach. So this approach, I think, is much easier if it's sort of an Ortolani positive hip. Comments, Ira? I, I agree. Um, if you can palpate the reduction of the hip, it's an easier approach, but oftentimes you have, you have to be able to find your way into the acetabulum without being able to reduce the femoral head. And so, as John mentioned, you really have to understand the an anatomical approach to the hip through a medial approach and how to preserve the circumflex vessel. And uh, as he mentioned, approaching the psoas tendon, which you have to release in an irreducible hip via a separate window from approaching the acetabulum allows you to preserve the vasculature. John, albeit the anatomy is somewhat drawn to the pleasure of the artist, uh, let's say this is somewhat accurate, the, the vessel, the, the diaphragm is fairly circumflex. My guess is we injure the lateral circumflex more than the medial circumflex when we do that. And that's what you probably doppler more often. Am I, am I, uh, is that right yes. or wrong? Or what do you think? I, I think that that is, I think that's absolutely accurate. And for some reason, this approach has an association with coxomagna. Coxomagna, yes, coxomagna, long neck, sometimes a short secondary. Okay. So when you're dopplering, John, you're probably dopplering where I'm pointing here on the, on the uh, lateral circumflex. Ira, any thoughts about where you are when you're doing this? Are you doppling or? I don't Doppler, but I, I try to identify the, um, the vascular leash. And I do agree, it's probably the medial portion of the lateral femoral circumflex, but it gives you a pretty good idea uh, um, as to where the medial femoral circumflex is coming off the profunda. And so I think as long as you identify the vasculature and you make sure you're not cutting any blood vessels, you're probably preserving the medial femoral circumflex as well. So we did all that and th I'll just stop here and it's reduced nicely and this patient went on and remodeled very satisfactorily. So we have six months of age, think of Pavlik. As we saw this slide earlier on, six to 18 months or beyond, close reduction depends upon how Ortolani positive or negative the hip is. I think we've all kind of summarized in our thoughts. And over 18 months, you begin to think more like we probably need to go to the OR, do an open reduction. Uh, when we go there, an open reduction. And let's go on with that. That's supposed to be where we're supposed to have started about an hour ago. So um, let's think of candidates for um, closed open reduction. Um, Antonella Figueros, is, are you on? Antonella, one of the fellows down in Buenos Aires. Hola, hola. Um, acá estoy. Is that a yes? I'm sorry. Yes, that's a yes. Okay, what do we do now? Previously, I did a, I did a pavlic harness and it totally failed. Uh, I mean, I, I couldn't get it to work. I tried a close reduction at four and a half months, totally Ortolani negative, and I didn't do the major approach. If I would just summarize, I didn't. And I said, wait till we're 10 months of age. And yes, there's more deformity. Uh, what would you do now at 10 months of age? What would be your approach to this problem, Dr. Figueres or Antonella? Eh, yo intentaría una reducción abierta por vía medial con 10 meses. Open reduction from, through the medial approach. Medial approach, okay. 
Uh, Eric, your approach, uh, if you're going to go and do this, as far as how would you think you're going to approach this? You know, at 10 months of age, you know, you can certainly do a medial approach. You know, the other alternative would be to, you know, delay a couple of months and just do a formal open reduction. I think a lot of it in my hands depends on how reducible the hip is. If you feel like you have an Ortolani positive hip that you can really, you can get reduced, a medial approach, I think, is, is reasonable. If you can't get it reduced, then I think that makes it harder. So this is totally asleep. Ortolani negative doesn't even suggest it. It suggests it would be positive when he was five months old and I examined him more. So I would approach this. John Schenecker, which, which would you be your approach to this? And Baxter? Uh, an anterior approach. Yeah. Baxter? Yes, if, if I am having trouble reducing the hip, then I yeah. prefer to do uh, at this age or around a year of age, an anterior open reduction because you can reduce or you can address both the obstacles to reduction as well as performing a capsule orifice. How about Rodolfo Goshenecki? También, si bajo anestesia no puedo reducirla, le hago una reducción por vía anterior. Anterior approach, Perry. Four months old, very proximally displaced. Uh, somebody answered this before, and um, uh, we'll come back. I mean, I, I, we, I think we said what to do before. Ira, what would be your approach here? So this patient's now about a year of age? Yes, sir. One year old and uh, big enough for surgery. And when you put the child to sleep, they're pretty proximally displaced and don't move too much. Right. So if you grade dysplasia, which we really don't do, um, these are very severe on one side of the spectrum. And, and I think that you need to address all potential deformities, even at a year of age. So I would do this via an anterior approach, and I would be prepared even to do you know, femoral osteotomies to correct uh, version and whatever else is necessary to reduce it. Uh, anybody disagree? Craig Smith, you out there? Oh, these guys didn't ever join. Okay. Two plus 11, your treatment approach. Um, let's go down to uh, Noelia Gonzalez, your treatment approach. Almost three, your treatment approach, no previous treatment. And uh, we see a dislocated left hip with a false acetabulum. Uh, close reduction, open reduction. If you're doing an open reduction, what are you gonna assign uh, on the permits for what, te what do you think you have to include in the open reduction? Sí, en este caso, por la edad de la paciente, iría, iría a quirófano pensando en, todos los, en, en hacer un abordaje anterior con un eh, tiempo femoral, que podría ser un acortamiento y de rotación si lo necesita, y hacer una cobertura pélvica. So she says open approach and then treat both the femoral side and possible the, the acetabulum side. As you see on the bottom. Yes. Juan, Pablo Gule. Can you read the English, sir? Hola. Yes or no? Open is actually a good idea? Or is it too late? We shouldn't operate. Sí, sí, estoy de acuerdo. Una reducción abierta, sí. Open reduction. Baxter, your upper age limit for bilateral? I don't mean, what, what would you think? Well, I start to think about not doing anything at around six, but that depends on the size of the child, the amount of dysplasia, a whole host of things. But usually at around six years of age with bilaterals, I'm thinking of leaving them. Jaime Candia, most experienced surgeon in the, on, the, on the call here with older hips. What, what is, baby, I still don't understand if Jaime's on the call or not, is he? Cecilia, ask him if Jaime Candia is on the call or not. Yes, Candia is on the call. Ask Jaime, you know. Jaime, puedes por favor eh, hablar con el doctor? Sácate el mute. Sí, yo estoy de acuerdo con la reducción de esta cadera por dos razones. Primero, tiene unos acetábulos bastante bueno, no están muy displásicos aparentemente los acetábulos. Si bien las caderas son altas, haría todos los componentes de la cadera para reducirla. 
tanto el componente femoral, el componente articular y acetabular. Pero me llama la atención que los acetábulos son bastante buenos, podría ser factible por ahí hacerle una osteotomía tipo Pemberton. Cecilia, succinctly summarize. He, he will try an open reduction with starting on the femoral side, and then he has, he's, he believes that the acetabulum doesn't look that bad, so probably a Pemberton. Oh, okay, so, but he would consider something on the pelvic side. Yes. It's not too, okay, all right, okay. Um, all right, uh, let's see. Um, Eric, uh, you're going to do these same setting, or how are you going to do this? Yeah, I, you know, this is one that you have to have, have to have a long discussion with the family about the pluses and minuses for. If you decide to go ahead and do it, I would tend to do them both at the same setting. Um, you know, talk to the family about blood loss and transfusions. Um, but uh, I would, uh, I would be, pref I would prefer to do them both at the same time. We'll get to this case a little later, okay? Barbie Castro, are you on the call? I guess not. Lucas Fernandez. Hola, se escucha? Sí. Okay, eh, answer the question, please. Somebody. Bueno, en, en este caso, por ser eh, unilateral, yo creo que es menos discutido el tema de tratarlo o no, y creo que lo más probable sería que sería mejor tratarlo, porque al ser una sola cadera probablemente le traiga síntomas y claudicación. So he says that he will try it. One of the main reasons is because it's unilateral. Your preferred approach to this, Baxter, decide, let's say we, we said you were gonna operate on this, so your preferred, what would your, be your combination of things? So I would start off with a, an open reduction, open reduction through an anterior approach. Child is almost certainly gonna need a, a, a proximal femoral osteotomy, a shortening correction of antiversion, and then I'm thinking probably a Pemberton for the acetabular dysplasia. Eric and I would no doubt do Pemberton's. Um, I don't think I could get a Zalter to do the right thing. Um, let's ask um, Ira and then John, their technique. So Ira, what would be your approach to this? So, uh, you know, th this is a very, very, very bad looking acetabulum. So assuming we're gonna do just a closed reduction, just a reduction, I would, I would do an open reduction. Um, I would, do this through an anterior approach and I would do obviously whatever femoral work is necessary, some shortening and some derotation. And then I would give serious consideration to doing a triple anominate osteotomy uh, rather than any sort of a bending acetabuloplasty because I think you get better coverage, better reorientation of the um, acetabulum and probably enhance the remodeling. How would your, what would be your, uh, your surgical approach would be, how, how would you get there? So um, I would do an anterior approach and uh, you know, you have full access to the capsule and via the anterior approach, you can dissect the whole pelvis in an extra periosteal fashion, which I think you know, you, you, you're well familiar with. And you can do a triple nominate osteotomy at this age. And that obviously preserves the triradiate growth and whatever uh, influence the triradiate will have on subsequent remodeling once the head is reduced. Bibiana, how would you get there? Cecilia, aparte de contestar, acá en México preguntan si ellos usan tracción de cualquier tipo, esquelética o de partes blandas en estos casos. So Barry, she's asking if a question from Mexico if they you if you you would use traction on this case. I used to be the traction for everything, and for this case, absolutely waste of time.
Bebiana, eh, how would sí. be your third? Nosotros tip? haríamos una reducción eh, con acortamiento femoral y posiblemente de rotación y algún tipo de acetabuloplastía que la eligiríamos en este momento. ¿Qué abordaje anterior? Anterior, sí. So anterior abroad with proximal femoral osteotomy and uh, some type of acetabuloplasty. John Shaneker, your thoughts on how to approach this and what to do? Um, I think that you have uh, really three main parts to it. You have the proximal femur, which I think needs a lot of attention with a, uh, probably a shortening and a derotation and uh, potentially varus. Um, I think that the um, intraarticular elements of it, the main thing that I've learned in doing these is that um, a lot of times at this age, the labrum is no longer in continuity of the uh, normal anatomic location and is often off. I think that putting it back down is incredibly helpful. And then you have the acetabulum itself, which I would love for our results to come up with a triple and a Pemberton, because I think a lot, I agree with him about getting the coverage, but I think also that the cartilaginous onlog of that lateral acetabulum is also very deformed, which I don't necessarily think is addressed by the triple. And it'd be great to be able to do both at the same time. Um, but I think those are the key elements of doing it while also Dopplering out, making sure that you don't cause AVN. How would you get there, John? Uh, interior approach, uh, and then lateral, obviously, for the, I'm sorry, not uh, for this one, if I thought that the labrum was off, um, we actually been doing uh, this through a trope flip osteotomy, because I think it gives you a much better view of the lateral rim of the acetabulum um, in order to actually put the labrum back down. And so you can do the, the whole surgery through that lateral flip other than the Pemberton. Okay, so you do the troke flip, you expose the capsule, you shorten, do the femur, you fix the labrum. Yep. And then you close the wound and then well, how do you get to the Pemberton? Another incision, right? Uh, just a, yeah, and you can do, if you're just doing the Pemberton through that incision, you can do a pretty small incision to do that. Okay, so different ways to get there, um, possibly, okay. Selecting best approach, closed versus open, is just so much part of the game. And I think this one here, as we talked about this, I think to do a major approach in this hip, I, re I know you, you, can, you said you're, you're comfortable, or maybe, maybe not. I did this patient at the same time, anterior approaches, and uh, thermal, uh, somewhat shortening, a little bit of rotational osteotomies. Um, I did that, I did that, and uh, I've over abducted a little bit so the head looks down a little bit. What do you think we've accomplished here? Good or bad? Juan Pablo Goulet, what do you think? You did open sí, reduction of the osteotomy. Sí, me parece que está, está bien reducido las dos. Están las dos por debajo de la línea de Hitchin Reiner, así que este, me parece un buen resultado. Good result, Perry. Uh, Travis, Winston, uh, uh, Raj, are you on? Raj Shariar? Travis, are you on? El doctor Goyeneche quiere hablar. Okay, Travis, uh, do we, should we do some uh, acetabuloplasties too in this 12 month old child? Um, I think about 12 months we still have the opportunity to remodel some and it's looking uh, like we're reduced so we can uh, either do that at a separate date if it doesn't remodel. So in cast, any other imaging, Travis? Um, we can get an MRI. Um, do we need other imaging? We've seen everything. Uh, do you need other imaging at this uh, uh, t time, um, Baxter? Yes, I would. Um, I think you really need to know that uh, it's not uh, subluxated out, out posteriorly. So I would get further imaging, uh, either an MRI or a few cuts of a CT scan. Yeah, that's all, is that true for everybody from the North American faculty? If not say, no, I don't do that. Okay, here no knows. How about uh, Bibiana Rodolfo in Buenos Aires? This hip is done open with proximal femoral osteotomies. You saw everything you did capsule or And that's actually, tells you that you've got a pretty good deep re reduction. 
So the teardrop the, right here, we're going to summarize. The yeah. teardrop is developing right here on both these hips. Cecilia, can you summarize Kay's comments? Sí, bueno, trajo el concepto de tracción en como este paciente obviamente es más pequeño, ellos, él cree en la tracción y después otros signos que utiliza sobre todo que es la, la imagen del fondo de lágrima para ver la, la reducción adecuada. Jaime Candia, do you use traction anymore on a patient like this preoperatively? Or anybody in uh, the Garahan faculty use traction preoperatively? Could you ask Cecilia? Si alguien allá en Sudamérica están utilizando la tracción preoperatoria. No, nosotros no, no la usamos. I used traction to right to the end, and what I found out was two things. Um, insurance companies wouldn't pay for traction in the hospital. And if I send patients home, even though I thought I was a very experienced popular surgeon. I found that parents would go find a surgeon who didn't use, lose traction, so I soon lost interest in traction. Can you summarize that, Cecilia? Sí, que básicamente acá lo dejó utilizar porque no, la, la, la parte de seguro social no lo paga, el seguro, y tampoco está, tenía mucha noción de lo que pasaba en la casa con la tracción. But the traction did, and it worked. It made the kids very floppy because they were in bed for three weeks. And that made it a little less muscle tension. It didn't change the anatomy in the hip, but it did make the kids loose, looser because they were weaker. And uh, I, los hace la tracción igual funciona en el sentido que el, los pacientes van a estar los chicos van a estar tres semanas en cama con tracción y se les termina relajando la parte de los tejidos blandos. But I think the summary from the call is nobody in bonus areas and nobody on their call in the North American faculty, which would be much in North America, is using traction anymore. Um, Cecilia. Sí, bueno, una, la, la, el resumen es que nadie está usando tracción ni en Norte, Norte América ni en South America. Pero había, había una pregunta de México que preguntaba exactamente por la tracción, así que puede ser que ellos la usen. Sí, y yo creo que cuando hicieron esa pregunta vino atrasada porque creo que después él dijo que, y el caso que estaba preguntando Perry era un caso de un chico más grande, pero en, esta, en este en cinco meses yo creo que sí. Preguntarle si, si los problemas de, de piel también fue un motivo por el cual pues nosotros lo usábamos y teníamos muchos problemas con la, con la piel de los pacientes en tracción, si también fue un motivo por el cual dejó de abandonar la, la tracción de parte blanda. Si de alguna, si hemos... Stop right there. Stop, Cecilia, you need to summarize the last two comments before we answer Dahlia's question. So in English, summarize what they said. No, basically that the, the one of the issues that they have with the traction and they stop using it is because they had a lot of issues with the skin, skin issues. Dalia had a question. Dalia Sepulveda from Santiago. Uh, gracias, Perry. En realidad era un comentario. En este caso de un año de edad, uh, en la radiografía previa a la que estamos viendo, eh, nosotros tenemos la conducta de hacer la reducción quirúrgica y eso significa eh, igual estabilizarla inmediatamente. Hubiésemos hecho exactamente lo mismo, pero creo que yo hubiese inmediatamente hecho algún gesto en el acetábulo, porque si no vamos a tener al niño enyesado o inmovilizado en dos periodos postoperatorios. Pregúntale, porque eh, cuando yo entro a operar a una open reduction, yo hago la reducción y hago inmediatamente si hay que hacer gestos en el tercio proximal del fémur y le agrego inmediatamente algo en el acetábulo porque no voy a, a dejar que el niño empiece a caminar mientras no tenga unos acetábulos eh, cercanos a lo normal. So, en este caso usted hubiese hecho también la parte acetabular. Sí, 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 sí. So Perry, she's, she's discussing that the, in this case she would have also treated the acetabulum. Ok, we'll give her another chance, here we go. <laughs> This is a... Uh, Case for, um, uh, let's see, Noelia Gonzalez. I keep, are you on the call? Sí, sí, acá estoy. Is that a yes or a no? Yes. Thank you. Okay, excuse my poor Spanish. Gate not looking. So, so this gate is like, no, not, the grandmother says the gate <laughs> is not like the other grandchildren. It, they kind of waddle, they waddle. 26 months old, two years, not very much weight, you know, 10 kilos. Uh, first x-ray, um, what do you see? Lo que se ve es que las dos caderas están luxadas. Bilateral hip dislocation. 
What should we do? ¿Qué hacemos? Bien, en este caso habría que hacer una reducción. Nosotros en el hospital haríamos de una por vez. O sea, hacer una, una reducción abierta con tiempo femoral y posiblemente el acetábulo. So, she, she, they will do a... a femur and also the acetabulum. And they will do one at a time. John Schenecker, what would be your approach to this patient? Hey, I'm sorry, can you move on? I'm on a, a patient call. Okay, uh, Baxter, your approach. So again, I'm likely looking at a, an anterior uh, open reduction. Um, proximal femoral osteotomy, uh, likely, and then uh, address the acetabular side probably with a Pemberton in this case. Uh, Ira? Yes. I would do, uh, I, I would do the same uh, approach as Baxter. I, I would probably uh, do a Salter osteotomy, even in a young kid with a low, you know, small body mass, I think it's my preference. And um, I would aim to do both sides at the same time. Uh, although you have to be very careful, especially in someone of this weight. Uh, Eric? I would probably do what Baxter talked about with a Pemberton. Although I would say that I'd probably do my Pemberton a little differently than what it's classically described. I wouldn't drive my osteotome down through the triradiate. I'd probably end just about the triradiate. I think you, you do similar things in younger kids like this. Bibiana? Lo mismo. They will do the same, Barry. Okay. So the family was very concerned about uh, more than one operation. And the anesthesiologist was obsessed with not losing too much blood. So I took a little different approach to, the, to, to doing this. And um, in fact, the anesthesiologist only wanted me to do one hip and guarantee her here I wouldn't have to give any transfusion and I'd have to go back and let that. And the parents, having heard all this, asked what could be done at one time. I don't know how, anyway, so that's the dilemma. So I thought what I should do here ahead of time, and I had two really strong feelings. The, the parents, to some extent, the anesthesiologist was just obsessed about blood loss. So I said, okay, we'll do one hip, I'll do the open reduction, I'll do the femoral osteotomy, and I'll tell you, we'll, we'll carefully calculate their blood loss. And I'd like to get the other hip done from the, for the parent's request, and then I'll proceed with the other hip. And I decided I probably wouldn't do the pelvic osteotomy on one side, because if the blood loss got a little bit, this anesthesiologist was gonna tell me quit. The parents didn't wanna do that. Can you summarize that for us, Cecilia? Sobre él, decide, decidieron hacer primero un solo lado, pero porque el anestesiólogo insistía en que no quería, que tenía concerns con él, porque era de 10 kilos el paciente y era chico, entonces decidieron hacerlo en un solo lado primero, no bilateral. So this is the open reduction on the left side. The, the osteotomy uh, made it much more stable, very, very stable. The blood loss was about uh, no more than 60, 70 cc's. It was very, very, and we were careful to collect it, watch everything, and you can't use a cell serve, not enough blood loss. And we got one done, and we, you know, we wanted to get the other hip done, and I thought at this time, this is a really small child, I'm going to do something that stabilizes both hips. I know I got to come back and take the plates out later on, and if I have to fix the pelvis, I'll do that at that time, because I knew if I did one pelvic osteotomy here, I got the 100 cc's the anesthesiologist was going to tell me, you have to quit. Uh, and no matter how I tried to convince him to be okay. So I did the other hip. I was very pleased. I did this uh, osteotomy for rotational purposes. And I assess him in flexion and extension. And if you bring him into extension, 
neutral rotation, they slide out anteriorly, and it's much better with intra rotation. I think the rotational osteotomy through a very carefully done approach helps this hip a lot. So I did that as the picture shows here, and we were able to, we had a total of 150 millimeters blood loss total. And I think I've solved the problem for the time being. The parents are very happy. Uh, the operation didn't take too long. And the anesthesiologist uh, did not have a cardiac arrest. And uh, that's where we are now. So I took a little different approach in this situation um, and uh, we'll rely on remodeling and maybe a, another uh, operation later for the pelvis that doesn't remodel enough. Am I way off base there, Ira, or what do you think? No, I, I think it's totally reasonable to approach it in that way. Um, I think you're better off reducing both hips at once than in, in this type of a situation. Because uh, again, you want to get the hips in and, and rely on biological remodeling as much as possible. Uh, I was going to ask you another question. Um, slips my mind. Um, you, Ira's pointed out something to me that I've learned at the heart. I mean, when you do an osteotomy of the femur, this is strictly a, this is a straight plate. And as you put it on, you're going to have just a tad of varus effect from the straight plate. Be careful about over rotation because if you turn the distal fragment out 30 degrees and you straighten the femur into a little varus, you can or cannot add inadvertently a little more rotation correction than you think. And you may end up potentiating some posterior position of the head that you didn't know you created. And that's even more so on a bigger, more dysplastic hip. Do you care to comment on that at all, Ira? I mean, I, I think that's a common. Hold on just hold on just a second. Can you say the, can you summarize that Cecilia in Spanish? I'm sorry. So I think that it's it's pretty it's a fairly um, unique circumstance where you can cause posterior instability from uh, over rotation, but um, in a really 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 shallow acetabulum, it's a balancing act, and you have to balance the soft tissues and you have to balance the femoral version uh, with the acetabular anatomy for stability. And so, um, you know, I think that it's something you have to be very very careful of. Uh, and assess intraoperatively uh, with examination once you've provisionally fixed the femur. Cecilia, could you in Spanish summarize what I, why I did what I did for the faculty and the fellows in South America? I don't know if they understood that. Maybe they did. Maybe, did you make the point to them that I had to stop because of the blood loss and that, the concerns? Yes, sí, no, lo que él, él dijo que hizo la corrección de los fémur y si no se fue al acetábulo porque el anestesiólogo tenía muchos concerns, entonces decidió que con el fémur era enough, suficiente, le dejó la cabeza reducida, los padres estuvieron contentos y, y esa fue la, la decisión por la cual él tomó hacer esta cirugía bilateral en los dos fémur y no corregir el acetábulo. John Schenecker, a, a, a remodeling potential here should be pretty good. I'm sorry, Patrick. He's on the phone, Barry. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll on the phone. Phone, phone call. Okay, here, here's our MRI, which you, I think everybody likes to get these MRIs. Even at this case, MRIs, uh, Bibiana, we get MRIs or CTs post-op to check uh, after these open reductions. Yes or no, Bibiana? Can you ask the question, Cecilia? I'm sorry, I forgot. No, no, no. No, no, radiographias. Only x-ray, Barry. Baxter, Eric, Ira, is this a waste of money getting the MRI after this? I get an MRI. I get an MRI as well. I think it's the, te the, the best test you can do nowadays. I tell you, I, I learn every time I get this MRI, a close reduction, I can say, you know, I should have internal rotated hip a little less or something like that. Even on this year, if I was in a position I didn't like, I say maybe I should change that caster three or four weeks. Um, can you summarize that, Cecilia? That the MRI is very it's instructional in, a, in more ways than I. Parece que al usar resonancia magnética también uno se auto enseña 
es muy importante, a él le gusta hacerla porque se fija bien cómo la redujo, si lo hizo bien, si no. Así que ellos usan resonancia después de la cirugía. And if the CT is available, fine, but you learn more because you see the cartilage better with the MRI. Is that not correct, Ira? Sorry, my video, I mean, my audio um, cut out for a second. I, 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 I learn more with the MRI than I do a CT for the same age person. I just see more. Yeah, I agree completely. And I think one area of focus, and perhaps John can co comment on this, is the position of the posterior neck and trochanter with respect to the posterior acetabulum and the implications on the, uh, on the vascularity of the epiphysis. Yeah, I agree with you, Ira. This is that you have to be very careful about making it so that you don't have uh, a big amount of soft tissue uh, caught up in there and um, putting unnecessary pressure on the vasculature to the epiphysis. In addition, that um, typically what you end up seeing on this is, is that you see that posterior wall of the acetabulum has a lot of ossification that it needs to do before it's really stable because it remains pretty uh, cartilaginous uh, a lot longer than I think we appreciate. How long would you leave the patient in a cast Sergio Innocenti? How long in sp Spica after this? Sergio no se puede conectar, pero acá hay una, una pregunta de Javier Masquijo acerca de la, la resonancia magnética con perfusión, si ellos la usan en estos casos. Perfusión que de intravascular para ver la circulación. No, eh, la resonancia magnética constatando la, la perfusión de la cabeza y con, con inyección de contraste. Sí, por eso. Okay. So they are asking if you ever do an MRI together with intra um, intravascular dye just to see the perfusion of the femoral head post correction. I do not. Uh... John or Ira or Baxter or Eric? John, do you do that? Contrast? Yeah. Contrast, yes. A contrast for the MRI. Yes. Um, yeah, yes, um, we have been. I can tell you that I think that um, it's a little bit different, difficult to interpret. Um, and I think that it's not just the contrast in terms of showing vascularity, but can also show pressure, which makes it a little bit, uh, again, more difficult to interpret. I think that you, if you see a whole head out, is, is that it might make you change what you do. If you see little areas that are out, I think that that can be very difficult to interpret what you should do next. Ira? So we, we have not been using um, <clears throat> intravenous contrast in our post-reduction MRI scans. There's a lot of resistance to that in uh, our radiology faculty. But um, you can get some information uh, from the plain MRI if you do cartilage sequences, which we have been doing. <clears throat> and on one occasion, I repositioned the hip because I thought that there, there, there appeared to be too much pressure uh, based on low si signal in cartilage sequences. So Ira, in that case, how, how much did you wait? Did you, do, did you go immediately and reposition? Well, I, it was a case of uh, bilateral reductions and on one hip, the, the epiphysis looked completely different than the other and the position in the cast was different And so I took the child back the next day and I, I changed the cast. I'm going to move on. I'm going to skip through this case because there's better stuff in the case. But this is a somebody uh, was 17 months old. There was a medial approach done. And uh, it came subluxated. It wasn't a vascular later. And it was treated with appropriate surgery. Uh, and uh, that happens, and uh, let's go to this case here. So this is a three-year-old, and uh, somebody I talked to, let's ask uh, Boris Perez to tell us um, what the gait will be abnormal about the child and why, Boris? Uh, 
perdón, eh, no entendí bien la pregunta. No, pero está preguntando qué, qué anormalidad tendría con la marcha este paciente con dos años, casi tres años y con esta displasia. Una marcha en tren de Lembur, eh, con la ubicación de la marcha hacia el lado derecho. Tren de Lembur, uh, walk, Barry. I didn't hear you, I'm sorry, Ceci. Yeah, the Trondelenburg limp. Trondelenburg limp, very good, there we go, okay. So, uh, how much pain uh, are we going to uh, have, Boris? Mucho dolor va a tener el paciente o no? Eh, la verdad, tuviéramos que revisarlo. Eh, ya parece tener un neacetábulo en la parte superior y... Young me pareciera, me da la sensación de que no tuviera dolor. No, no pain. Yeah, they present because they limp, no pain. Okay, good. So, um, what do you want to do for this? Three plus two now. Boris. Uh, doctor, uh, realizaría en primera instancia un acortamiento femoral con una osteotomía derrotadora para este paciente. Ya tiene tre, tres, años, tres años y dos meses. Eh, como también una, un, una osteotomía periacetobular, le habría un Pemberton para su edad. So he would, he would treat both the femur and the acetabular side, femur at a proximal uh, shortening and irritation on osteotomy and a Pemberton on the acetabular side. So uh, I, I would totally agree. Romina Cerizo has her hand up. Can she ask a question, please, Sabrina? Speak up. Let's talk louder, please. Did anybody hear a question? No, I did not hear anything. Ramina, try it again. Uh oh, Ramina, that's a big speak. Okay, I guess Ramina's off the call. Okay, and I think uh, Boris has got it nailed right on the head. So here's your open reduction and your PFO, Boris. Is it Boris? Boris? Or what is it, Boris? Boris. Boris, what a good name. Boris Perez. <laughs> Uh, what do you think your open reduction PFO is the head reduced? Use all the information and all the idiot lines that you can use. Perdón, no entendí la pregunta. Si sí, sí, está la cabeza reducida con esa imagen que te puso ahí. Eh, sí, aparentemente pareciera reducida la cabeza femoral. Yes, very. So this is a three-year-old child. Anybody from the faculty in um, the Garahan would stop here and, and, and just wait then, stop. Bibiana, can you summarize for your faculty? Sí. Está preguntando si alguien haría algo más en este paciente. Yo, como se los mencionaba, posiblemente... Hay un signo de, muez, de una muesca a nivel acetabular donde está marcando justamente la flecha. Eh, se podría, lo podría esperar, pero mm, también hay la posibilidad de hacerle una Pemberton o cualquier otro tipo de techoplastía. So he, he said that a Pemberton would not be bad. But he could also wait. Okay, who's talking? Uh, Boris. Okay, can somebody in the faculty, uh, would, would somebody from the faculty, and uh, uh, Boris is, a, uh, okay, wonderful Boris, but can somebody more older faculty, uh, Rodolfo or Sergio or Jaime, Jaime, uh, uh, summarize what they, uh, do they ever stop right here and just wait? Um, I'm curious what they have done historically and what they do now as far as doing the pelvis, uh, Cecilia. Estoy preguntando, Perry, si el, alguno de los faculty de allá de South America paran acá o hacen algo más en el acetábulo. No, le haríamos una, una osteotomía de acetábulo, una Pemberton, una Vega o un, probablemente un Solter también. Sí, eh, Perry, so they say they will do some, something additional in the pelvis, either like a Pemberton uh, or Salter. 
uh, specs you can use summaries for North America? I think uh, most North American surgeons would probably nowadays do a Pemberton, but uh, a Salter would also be uh, uh, a very appropriate procedure, especially if the femoral head is a bit large, um, to rotate that acetabulum and get it into a better position. So, uh, Boris, there's three things we did here, maybe four, maybe we did a little adductor tenotomy, maybe not, but the three big things are an open reduction, a PA, proximal femoral osteotomy, and maybe a pelvic osteotomy. What is the cri most critical part of this operation? Can you summarize, Cece? Sí, so él dice que acá le hicieron la parte femoral, la parte de la osteotomía pelvis, de la pelvis, sobre el, con una abordaje anterior, y te pregunta qué es lo más crítico de esta cirugía. Eh, siempre controlar de que no haya una necrosis femoral, siempre ver de que el el acortamiento sea lo suficiente para que no genera presión a nivel de la cabeza femoral. So he will be only making sure that there's not enough pressure on the femoral head to produce a secondary oste osteonecrosis. What's the most important technically thing he has to do and the most difficult thing to do? ¿Qué es lo más importante técnico y lo más difícil de hacer en esta cirugía? He scrubbed the knees before I take it. Ask him. What, Barry? Ask him if he has scrubbed on a fair number of these before. I'm sure he has. Boris, hiciste bastante de estas, no? Hice un, sí, un par de estas. Pero al momento de realizar la, lo más complicado al momento de realizar es justamente la reducción y ver que esté bien posicionada la, la cabeza que a veces dificulta dependiendo el, eh, si, si tengo buena apertura de la cápsula articular. So he, he, uh, Perry, he says about the reduction of the femoral head. That's the more critical part. And ask Jaime Candia what's the most essential part of reducing the head. ¿Qué es la parte más esencial para reducir la cabeza femoral en el acetábulo? Sí, le está preguntando a Jaime, a Jaime Cambia. Él quiere preguntarle a Jaime. Ahí va, ahí va Jaime. Eh, lo más importante es la apertura capsular, evaluar el acetábulo, tratar de eliminar todos los que presenten el acetábulo para una reducción que va a ser evaluar. Can you did you hear what he say, Cece? Can you tell us? No, no, porque no escucho. I cannot understand what he's saying. He's kind of yeah. down. one more chance, Jaime. Okay, I would just show the Jaime habla ahora. Sorry. Okay. Lo, lo más importante es la reducción abierta, evaluar el acetábulo, ¿sí? limpiar bien el fondo del acetábulo, eliminar todos los obstáculos y dar una reducción en procedencia. So efectuar el acortamiento femoral necesario para que la cadera no entre a presión. Y en ese momento evaluar el tipo de cobertura que tiene esa cadera ¿sí? en la posición de la unidad para ver si tiene un déficit de cobertura anterior, lateral o posterior, y en base a eso se hace la misma cobertura. Ok, so I couldn't understand too much just because he's breaking down, but basically he was saying I'm making sure that the femoral head is reducing the acetabulum and there's now no intraarticular tissue that is getting that femoral head out. Thank you. Eric Gordon, if you were going to help the fellows learn things, uh, which is so critical for fellows. And let's say the three things you're going to do are a, a Pemberton of some type or a Salter and a PFO and an open reduction. Would there be one part in particular there? Would you insist I got to be there for a certain part? Because Eric is very good at letting people do things when they should. Would there be one part that you think you really have to check, Eric? I'm leading the witness. I realize that. But. <laughs> I think by, by far and away for me, the, the most important part is the reduction. You know, no matter whether you do a, do a, a pelvic osteotomy or not, you have to get the hip reduced. You can't compensate for a, a bad open reduction with a, uh, with a pelvic osteotomy. 
And just so everybody's sanity here, we're going to quit at 1030. Uh, we have got through about oh, a third, so I have another whole session. We'll go through this thing Eric just talked about and problems not doing that. So we'll be done for sure by 1030. So I didn't have any fellowship when I was young and we learned, we taught each other how to do this stuff. There wasn't else around. And I hung out with a guy named Sherman Coleman, who was a wonderful surgeon. He's dead in Salt Lake City. Never got to scrub with him, but he kept telling me, learn how to do a good open reduction. Just learn how to do that. And I said, what about the PFO? He said, you probably can do that too. And I say, what about the pelvis? He said, Barry, don't get too many parts moving at one time. Maybe he was concerned about what I could or couldn't do, but he taught me the, per the point of get a good open reduction and add the PFO as you have to. If you think you have to do the pelvis at that time, fine. But I, I learned on a lot of hips that way, and I learned the hard way, but you really have to get a good open reduction. And you've already told us, uh, Serge, that this is. Could you summarize briefly what I just said? Y es básicamente lo que estaban diciendo ustedes, eh, Jaime y, y Boris, que lo más importante es lograr la reducción de la cabeza femoral en acetábulo. Que, y es más importante inclusive que la, la osteotomía proximal, lo más importante es tener la cabeza femoral eh, reducida. Perry, I need to go. Ok, thank you so much. So, uh, Sabrina, you're on, ok? Thank you, everybody. I think Thank Viviana you, is going so to... Thank you so much. Have a good day. Muchas gracias. No, no. Great, great Thank session. You. Thank you. Gracias, Cecilia. Sabrina, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. I think Viviana is going to help us as well. I didn't understand that. Yes, Viviana is going to help us with the translation as well. Okay, all right, so hold, Marilabi, uh, Karka, uh, we'll wait, have Dr. Kamakawa just wait a second. Okay, we wait a second. So, wait, wait, wait. Let me finish. Okay, so we we we're going to go through this and then we'll ask answer questions. Okay, so we got this there. We plan to this. Excuse me. This is a left hip. Turn your brain around, and now this is a right hip. Can everybody understand that? So this is a right hip after open reduction and the PFO through separate, separate incision. And now we're gonna check stability. Can you say that, Sabrina? So we're in flexion and the hip is gonna be stable. It's stable posteriorly. We haven't made that unstable. Say that, Sabrina que la reducción en flexión tiene que ser estable y chequear que no se vaya posterior. And then we check it in extension. Y después lo hacemos en, en extensión. You can see this and you can translate this into Spanish as you see it. Go ahead and translate it, Sabrina. Translate to English, Sabrina, to Spanish. Vivi? Sabrina, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I thought Viviana was going to do it. Translate the English to Spanish that you see on the board. Do you see the slide? Sí, sí, perdón, es que entendí que Viviana estaba haciendo la traducción. Eh, dice, perdón, que no lo no puedo ver bien. Eh, después del OR y el PFO, eh, llegan a la estabilidad en extensión versus flexión o abducción. Y si es inestable sí, en pero ya está. One at a time, please. One speaker at a time. Okay. Bibiana, did you have something to add? No, no, it's okay. Okay. But you can go. I think it's important to understand what you're doing when you do this. So this hip should be more stable, it will be, in flexion than extension because the socket is still very deficient anteriorly and laterally. Sabrina, can you do that? I'm sorry, Perry, I think Viviana is doing the translation. Oh, Viviana, go ahead. Okay. Hay que chequear en flexión y en extensión y eh, tratar también en abducción si es inestable en abducción y extensión. Go, you can go. 
Perry, go again. Read on. Si, si eso está bien, usted puede hacer una osteotomía o de Solter o de Pemberton o de Dega y elegir cuál es la cobertura más adecuada. So you can say, Bibiana, in Spanish, everybody looked at this three-year-old child to begin with, and we all thought we were going to do the pelvis osteotomy, and I did too, but I'm just trying to show them how you assess your stabilities. Cuando chequea una la estabilidad, entonces después, en todos los planos, con la producción, extensión y flexión, uno puede eh, saber qué técnica va a emplear en la cadera. En este caso, parece que una osteotomía so de Pemberton. A three-year-old three child, we have the Pemberton, very powerful, and we have the Salter-like, a little less powerful, but a little less dangerous, too, as far as overcorrecting. Can you say that, Bibiana, in Spanish? Sí. Sí, que la Pemberton es una osteotomía incompleta, que la Solter es una osteotomía muy poderosa, pero hay que tener en cuenta que puede sobrecorregir. ¿Ok? No, 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 no es algo. Somebody had a question before that they want to answer? Ask it. Sí, Rodolfo. Entiendo que es menos común que sobrecorregir con la Solter que con la Pemberton. Con, which type of osteotomy can uh, perform overcorrection, uh, Perry? I'll let Ira answer that. Uh, I think that the Pemberton is more likely to cause overcorrection. Um, and uh, the Salter is less likely to achieve overcorrection in general. I can guarantee you I can overcorrect this with a Pemberton, and I don't think I can overcorrect it with a Salter because I've corrected overly too many hips with the Pemberton. Very powerful. Bibiana, you got to translate that. Sí, está de acuerdo con Rodolfo que la que se, se sobrecorrige más con la Pemberton que con el Solter. Pero es una osteotomía muy, muy poderosa la Pemberton para él. Se puede corregir mucha la anteversión, la, la displasia acetabular. Viviana, what is the most uh, popular pelvic osteotomy in this situation, three and a half year old child in Buenos Aires? La más popular es la Solter. Si ustedes están de acuerdo, Solter osteotomy. I think there is a place for the Solter. And that is if you have a little different situation, not this patient, but if you have a patient who's had some, has some coxa magna, I'm a little more likely to consider the Salter and not the Pemberton because I think you have a chance to impinge the head too much if the head is relatively the same size in circumference or radius as the socket. So if the head's big, I'm a little concerned about doing the Pemberton. Si la cabeza, sí, si la cabeza femoral es grande, él se preocuparía de hacer una Pemberton y elegiría la solda. Okay. Judge, have any thoughts on that? Say the question again. I broke up. Uh, the Salter is more forgiving if the femoral head, maybe not in this situation, a primary hip, but if the femoral head is relatively larger, then the, the head's usually smaller than the... Than the yeah, I think a Pemberton with a, uh, a, a larger femoral head, uh, especially down the road, can really cause some problems. I think you, you cause impingement. It's a, um, you get hinge, uh, our, our cam uh, motion with it. So 
I think the salts are being redirectional, not changing the shape of the, astia, uh, of the acetabulum is beneficial. Baxter? Agreed. Cecilia, uh, go ahead, Baxter, sorry. Um, probably up till uh, 10 years ago, I would routinely in these cases do a salter, but there were some cases where I just wasn't happy with the correction of the acetabular dysplasia, and I think the Pemberton allows more correction, but you have to be very careful. Clinically, you wanna flex the hip up and ensure that you've got easily 90 degrees of flexion when you're finished at Pemberton, so it's not overcorrected. Can you summarize our thoughts on that, Bibiana, in Spanish, please? Sí, eh, entonces cuando uno tiene una cabeza femoral grande es preferible hacer una solter. Eh, si bien Perry eh, le, le gusta hacer más la Pemberton como a Baxter Willis, pero tienen que tener el recaudo de que las cabezas no sean muy grandes y flexionar la cabeza hasta los 90 al terminar la técnica, porque si no puede producir impeachment. Uh, Sabrina, are there any questions okay. that have been answered? Preguntas? Alguien quiere hacer preguntas? I'm going to move on otherwise. Eh, creo que eh, Dr. Albarracín, you wanted to say something? El Dr. Albarracín, ¿quiere abrir el mic y hacer tu pregunta? Perry, yo tengo una pregunta. Perry, I have a question. You did some studies not too long ago about the vascularity when you do an osteotomy that you can get avascular necrosis of the pelvic part. You didn't, didn't you do that in dogs? Can you comment on that? Did you hear me? Yeah, I heard you. I'm amazed that anybody ever read the article. Uh, yeah, we did it 40 years ago. And what we did is we cut the pelvis and the dogs and we tried to see what cut would affect circulation and in the dogs, both the Salter and the Pemberton type would make the fragment of the ilium distally always relatively avascular for quite a while. That was in dogs and it made me, yes, and I think sometimes you can tell if you cut through a pelvis once you come and do it again, you don't get quite the same bleeding. Maybe I was looking for that, but the Summary for the audience, Bibiana, would be, well, I tell you what, Kay, you're, you're, you're going to be, be Spanish, you want to do it in Spanish and say that, Kay? Can you do that? Sí, eh, Kay Wilkins le preguntó que él había sido, ha hecho hace años, hace 42 años atrás, eh, un artículo sobre qué pasaba con el fragmento distal en las osteotomías, y ese artículo se hizo en perros, en donde ellos estudiaban la vascularización pélvica de toda la pelvis cuando se hacía la osteotomía y principalmente del fragmento que se desplazaba. And to carry that one step further, Kay, I think when you do a Pemberton, I make this cut really high. If you make the Pemberton like it shows his Tonus's book or like Pemberton did it, they cut very close to the joint. And sometimes I think you lose some circulation to the tissues out here that is a negative in further acetabular development. Can you summarize that, Viviana, in Spanish? Sí, entonces lo que él eh, recomienda es hacer el corte del Pemberton bien alto, no como lo dice, eh, lo describió Pemberton, muy al ras del de borde acetabular para que no haya necrosis. Okay. Karen, I, I, I agree there. And you know, I've looked at some in the long term in some of my osteotomies, and I think I see uh, changes of avascular necrosis that kind of slow down the development. So, an ultracosis, Perry, yo acuerdo que usted, pero yo ha visto señales de necrosis avascular in la fragmenta distal. In other words, I have seen some, what I think is evidence, as you follow them along, there is some evidence, I think, in the development of the acetabulum that looks like it's a little avascular, and it takes a while before you begin to get some changes 
in the acetabulum. So yo he visto cosas cuando tiene evidencia, tiene y vascular cosas que va a hacer más despacio la desarrollando de la acetabulum. I think we found a person that speaks for Cecilia, both languages. So somebody, Jimenez uh, so, or somebody had a question. Uh, Sabrina, there was a question on the board. Lo que dice Kate Wilkins es que él ha visto en varias caderas que hay eh, signos de necrosis si uno hace la osteotomía eh, baja y eso eh, va en contra del tratamiento de la displasia. ¿Alguien quiere hacer alguna pregunta en este tópico? So here's the lateral cut and uh, I would suggest you learn to do what uh, I've watched Ira do, pack sponges, pack, 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 pack. You really cut down, I think, on blood loss. Be careful with the blood loss. And there's gonna be the lateral cut and it's generously exposed and it's a big cut. And they have to imagine on the inside with the yellow arrows, there's the medial cut. Uh, I first, when I did these years ago without a CRM, um, particularly if the capsule isn't open, I think was lucky I didn't get into the joint because the CRM really helps you direct this by doing oblique x-rays when I do it. And I turn it down as such, and I put a big bone graft, don't turn it too much, don't overcorrect. Um, yes, sir, we have a question here. Uh, do you have hold a- on, Hold on, stop, 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 stop. Sorry. Let's just talk okay. about, well, hold on, hold the question. So let's talk about technique here, what I've done. Um, um, uh, on, stop, 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 stop. Uh, can you, can you say what, excuse me, Viviana, can you translate what I said? Sí, sí, hablamos de la técnica, entonces él está, eh, mostró recién los cortes, cómo eh, abre la osteotomía y pone el injerto, siempre teniendo eh, el cuidado de no sobrecorregir, entonces lleva la cadera a una flexión de 90 y ver si eso eh, hace algún tipo de de tope o eh, no, para impedir que haya una sobrecorrección. Eric, do you do your technique a little less open or this is an open hip so you get to see everything? No, I do these, I do these much more, much less of an incision than you do. I don't visualize it. Um, I usually make an incision, you know, just a few, a few centimeters and uh, visualize, get the area of the, uh, uh, the iliac wing and uh, start my osteotomy just below the ASIS and they do it almost all CRM controlled. But I mean, and, but, and that's particularly true if you're not doing a capsulotomy at the same time. Oh yeah, that's absolutely, that's just an isolated Pemberton. Um, John or Baxter, Eric, any comment on technique here? No, Perry. I. I guess as Eric, if I'm just doing the osteotomy, a little smaller incision, but uh, otherwise I think exactly the same as you're describing here and showing. Todos hacen la técnica de, las, de, de la misma forma, pero Eric, por ejemplo, eh, hace una incisión mucho más eh, pequeña para realizarla. Y eh, hacen los cortes teniendo en cuenta Eh, poner los rayos en forma oblicua para ir chequeando la dirección de la osteotomía. Go ahead. Uh, Bebiana, somebody had a question before and I asked them to wait. You wanna, you, can we have that question now? Uh, Dr. Luis was asking, do you have any recommendations regarding the height of the Pemberton cut to modify the coverage and apart from the vascular risk? Okay, Ira. Yes. Please help me because everybody tells me if I, and maybe you're one of those, if I bleak this the correct way, I can make more lateral coverage or anterior coverage. And Sherman Coleman talked about that forever. I could never quite get it to go where I wanted except grab that big, big fragment and kind of twist it where I wanted. Help, help us out here. So I, I am probably not the person to help you out on because I believe in acetabular rotation and I almost exclusively do Salter osteotomies. I'm always afraid of, uh, of uh, pressure in the articular cartilage and the subchondral cartilage and the epiphyseal cartilage of the head. So I, I like to do Salter osteotomies and I, I've never figured out how you can actually achieve unidirectional correction in a 
in a spherical joint. I think it's physically impossible. Okay, so I won't ask Eric as he hardly looks at it, but I'll ask John Schenecker, how do we, can you, how much can you control which way this tilts more laterally, more anteriorly? Um, I think you can somewhat. I don't think that it's um, a free reign on it for sure. I think it usually gives you much more anterior lateral coverage. I think the only way you can really hold it to direct the coverage is uh, actually using more um, screw type fixation or pins than just using a graft. I think you have a tendency when you do this to use a graft that kind of goes where it wants to go. Uh, does the person who asked, can you summarize that, Bibiana? Sí, eh, están discutiendo eh, la preferencia. Eh, Jenneker le ha consultado a Aira y Aira dice que él eh, no puede hablar mucho sobre la Pemberton porque él siempre elige mejor la solta, tiene mucho cuidado en, en la sobrecorrección y también lo que considera es eh, que le puede, el solter se puede orientar en distintas formas, es más eh, reorientable que una Pemberton. Y lo que dice John es eh, acerca de poner solo un injerto en la Pemberton, esa es la ventaja, y en la otra tener que hacer dos cirugías para retirar las clavijas o utilizar clavijas en el solter como se hace. So Bibiana, you know who's, uh, you, you got Anfeld, Sergio, Rodolfo, yourself, and Jaime. You guys got a lot of experience. Uh, so what do you people think you can do about redirecting the Pemberton just the way you want it or something? You can, you can't, uh, or can you ask one of your faculty? Can you respond back to us what you guys think? Jaime, ¿querés contestar que estás levantando la mano? O Rodolfo. Sí, yo creo que las indicaciones tanto de Susan de Pemberton no es exactamente igual para, para las caderas. ¿sí? Yo creo que la Susan tiene una limitación por la edad de los pacientes, sobre todo más allá de los tres años de edad, o cuatro, por mucho, o sea, la corrección que se obtiene de los estados ya no es tan excelente a diferencia de la Pemberton. Los dibujos que se muestran son en caderas normales, tanto la suerte como la Pemberton. Pero si miramos las radiografías originales, la osteotomía de Pemberton la tenés que hacer, como dice, bien alta, si no, no sirve. Y con la Pemberton tenemos la opción de tener mayor corrección, mayor cobertura, tanto anterior, posterior o lateral, de acuerdo a cómo se coloca el injerto. También la suerte depende de la digamos, del ancho del, del injerto que se coloque. Ambas técnicas tienen la posibilidad de que pueden colapsar los injertos o perder eh, corrección, que después del tiempo requieran otra cirugía para mejorar esa cobertura. ¿Qué dice? Doctor eh, Jaime, yes. Doctor Jaime dice que ambas técnicas tienen pros y cons. And he preferred to do solder until for a, a age of old, or a four years old patients, not a, in older patients than four. He prefers to do Pemberton in, in, in older patients and depends on the growth of the of the, um, ah, the, um, oh, you can cut the, the bone to put in, in the, uh, more or less where, where you want. You understand me? Yes. Okay. Um, so here we are, and here we go, and we did this, and we did that, and we did this. Bone graft from the femur, put it in. Um, I've learned the hard way that when you do this, and we'll get to this in our next session, I think you shouldn't um, do things so that you, on a normal person, you should leave at least 90 to 95 degrees of flexion carefully measured because they don't regain their flexion. They don't. And you don't see the cartilage 
that is beyond the bone that you've corrected. So here is the x-ray. Okay, say that please, Bibiana, about don't overdo this, watch your motion. Antes de, de terminar la cirugía y dar por finalizado la técnica, tienen que eh, constatar que hay eh, de, la que no se limita en 90 grados o 99 grados y mover la cadera en las direcciones que ya se mencionó. I sí. never had... Go ahead, sorry. No, sí. go ahead. Okay, go. No. I never paid any attention to that until 26 years ago, 27, I went to Boston and scrubbed with Mike Millis on learning how to do a Gans PAO. And he kept telling me, like Mike keeps telling everybody a lot, he's great, great teacher, leave flexion, leave 90 degrees of flexion if you're doing a PAO on a 25 year old or a PAO on a 20 year old, leave some abduction, leave flexion. And what he was telling me is he has impinged, he had impinged patients, this was years ago, doing a PAO, older patients, stands to reason. And I then began to start thinking about these kids. So I found that taking the lesson about older kids, older adults, that you can easily impinge them if you overdo like a gonz or a triple, you should be careful also on these kids for fear of impingement later on in life. Can you summarize that, Bibiana? Sí, que la lección la aprendió cuando empezó a hacer la osteotomía periacetabular, que eh, en Boston le dijeron cuando él estaba haciendo la cirugía que siempre chequee todos los movimientos, en flexión, aducción y extensión. Y entonces él pensó, ¿por qué no chequearlo en estos chicos también? Así que a partir de ahí, él recomienda siempre, antes de terminar la cirugía, Chequear todos los movimientos para ver que no haya impeachment. Any okay. comments, yes or no, uh, from the North American faculty? I think hey, are you routinely now fixing a Pemberton osteotomy? I put in a pin more often than not, but some of that's also, also related to maybe a, a problem you had. I had one that fell totally, that fell apart, shouldn't have. So I started putting pins in and taking them out later. I put a jerky ball around it. I might take it out two years later. So I put one in more often than not when somebody's three years older or, or older. And if they're five or six, I put a screw in it. That's what I do, Baxter. What do you, what do, you uh, do uh, Baxter? If it's quite stable in the young ones, we haven't been putting any internal fixation. The older kids, I put screws in, cannulated screws. Ira? Um, I use uh, pins for the younger kids, and I use screws for older kids. Eric? I use screws for almost all the kids, um, but then again, I often, do, unless I've done a reduction or something else, I often don't put these kids in a cast either. Jonathan? Uh, just pins for younger kids um, and you know just like I just said screws for older La discusión se basa en eh, que Baxter Willis le preguntó si estabilizaba con algo la eh, la toma de injerto y eh, Perry dice que hasta los tres años por ahí usa clavijas y después eh, tornillos eh, Eric eh, mayormente usa tornillos y los otros piensan igual que Perry usar Sí, no es estable el injerto, si, es, si, no es, si es estable, nada, pero si no es estable, clavijas, y any después de los thoughts, tres años, todo. Uh, any other comments about that from uh, the uh, South American faculty you want to summarize for us, Bibiana, regarding fixation for pelvic osteotomy, certainly for the Salter, but for the Pemberton? ¿Alguien quiere eh, de Argentina hacer alguna pregunta sobre la estabilización del Pemberton? No, no. There's Very a question in particular. At the chart that says, any recommendations if the Pemberton is accidentally completed to the sciatic notch? I, I, I did, it's, who understood? I didn't understand that, I'm sorry. That's fine, I can repeat. They are asking, 
Any recommendations if the Pemberton is accidentally completed to the sciatic notch? Yeah, my recommendations are, you know, if you recognize you've broken it, you can still treat it somewhat as a Pemberton. You have to make it sure it's more stable and you probably need to put it in a cast or just assume you've it's turned into a complete osteotomy and stabilize it some more, but you can treat it similar as you would a Salter or a Pemberton. Would you not agree, Ira? They broke they broke through the, uh, in, you know, they broke through the whole thing. It became a complete osteotomy inadvertently. I, I agree with you. I think you can still treat it. Um, you know, I, I'm a Salter person and I think, you know, you get some bending of the, of the acetabulum when you do a Salter as well. So you're probably getting an equivalent effect in that regard. So this is my understanding of where Adega came from, having the little ready I've done it, but I read what he wrote a long time ago. And remember when Dega and Pemberton were doing their procedures in the 60s and the 70s, there were no C-arms. And you did surgery and once in a while you got an x-ray. And Dega got frustrated because the incomplete osteotomy he was trying to do on a smaller child often became what the discussant just said, a complete osteotomy. And one of the reasons I think he stops going as far as Pemberton did was he got frustrated with breaking through all the time. And that's kind of where the osteotomy came from. So anyway, I think you treat it that way. So any other questions that are waiting to, because I'm gonna summarize here to respect people's time or over time. So any other questions that should be answered before I give you a preview of what'll happen when we get together manana, which could be a month or two from now. Any other yeah. questions? Uh, first, Viviana, yeah. would you like to... ¿Querés resumir lo que acaba de decir, Vivi, antes de la pregunta? Eh, yeah. No, que, que la, la osteotomía se puede romper, pero se trataría como una... como se trata la, la osteotomía completa de Solter. Eh, se pondría el injerto y se estabilizaría igual. Yeah, yeah, Perry, I have one other question and comment, yeah. and then maybe you can comment on it. Yes, the question I think the, the other thing, other than getting a reduction, is the quality of your capsulography. Because I think that's the one thing that also helps stabilize your hip. Many years ago, when Salter was doing his osteotomies, he was getting good results. Other people didn't get as good results. And they went back and tried to find out, and they found out the reason Salter had better results is because he had a good capsulorophy. So in ultracosis and ultrapalavis, very by discutir la importancia de una capsulorophy. Yo pienso es muy importante secundario de obteniendo una reduction. In other words, I think that next to getting a reduction, that the capsulorophy is important. You know, we've been focusing on the bones, but we don't always need to finish, I mean, to forget the soft tissues. Estamos secundando sobre los huesos, muy importante, no obedo, no no importante to forget the uh, tejidos blandos. In other words, it's important not to forget the importance of correcting the soft tissues in addition to the bone. Thank you. Well, you said that both in, okay, hold on. You've said that both in English and Spanish now. Is that correct? Did you say? What did you say? You've said it both in English and Spanish, correct? Well, I don't know. My Spanish is probably not that okay, good. Okay. That, okay. Well, the answer, okay. Lo que dice Kate es que estamos, están hablando mucho de cómo corregir eh, tanto la, el acetábulo, pero eh, lo más importante de esta cirugía es saber que hay que hacer una buena capsulotomía y una estabilización y cápsulorrafia. Esa es la llave de esta cirugía. Cuando uno tiene una buena eh, estabilización capsular, eh, ahí uno se puede quedar tranquilo y eso era porque Solta tenía tan buenos resultados, no tanto dependiendo de la osteotomía que, 
que hacía. Gracias, Perry. You, you can go. Okay. I, she's, she's doing stop. a good job. Okay, stop. Okay, stop, 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 stop. Hold on. I totally concur. Okay, let me just show the point. This hip here, I think, needs a PFO and a very well done capsulography. 12 months old. Totally concur what you say. And we're going to talk about capsulography later. We haven't got that far about the dangers and when to do it. I think that hip needs it very, very, very well done. This hip here. Okay. The hip we just showed probably needs it done too. It's a little less important the more bony surgery you do. But again, the most important part of the operation that somebody very correctly answered, maybe Boris, you've got to get this reduction. That's the most critical thing. I think Jaime talked about. So I think here it's important too. Most important, the young one. The older you get, seemingly the less it's going to be the critical part. But your point about the capsule orphy is, is, is I think on the younger hip that you've done less bony stuff is absolutely essential. Um, Baxter, chime in on that? Oh, agree completely. The reduction is the most important part, but the capsulography, as Kay has outlined, is very critical in most of these cases uh, to success of the uh, procedure. Um, Bibiana, the uh, philosophy of that in um, uh, Garahan or Bonus Aries, the importance of the capsulography uh, age-wise, or how important is it? ¿Alguien del Garraja quiere hablar sobre la importancia de la cápsula rafia? Ok, have all questions been answered? No more questions. Ok, here we go. So we're going to go on next time when we resume, we're going to show similar things and we're going to get into a point where you get this right here. We'll stop right here. So this is a patient who has had a... Uh, uh, one more question here for, oops, something came on my screen. So let's finish by answering, um, who has an, Antonella Figueres, are you on? Yes. Okay, what do you, this patient's had an open reduction and a PFO on the right hip. The left hip is still dislocated. How does it look? Here's the femoral head ossifying, here's the osteotomy. This is about six months after open reduction and a PFO. They did an open reduction, they did a PFO. Does the hip look seated? Does the hip look superior, inferior, lateral? How do you think? ¿Qué te parece que pasó en esta cadera? Te pregunta. Que se hizo un, un año después de, de una open reduction y una osteotomía eh, femoral. Did they do a good job? Um, La veo que no parece reducida, eh, o sea, parece reducida en el acetábulo, pero está lateralizada eh, y quizás haya tenido algún tipo de daño vascular. Bebiana. It's not reduced, it's not reduced and with signs of a vascular necrosis. Ok, but it's not, is it reduced, uh, Antonella, or not? No. So then, Sorry. Uh, okay. I think that it's, uh, no, so she said no. Okay, okay, okay. She said no, right? Yeah. Correct. Did, okay, stop there. So they said, okay, it's not reduced, so we'll do a pelvic osteotomy. Here's so now they came a little later and did a pelvic osteotomy. We did a pelvic osteotomy, here. so we did that. And now it's after. Now we got it after the open reduction, quote unquote, the femoral osteotomy. Now, pelvic. now it's still not reduced any better. So it's not. So, what do we do now, Antonella? Antonella, ahora qué hacemos? Porque tiene todo lo demás más una osteotomía acetabular. ¿Tú la dejarías así? No, le volvería a hacer una, este, una reducción abierta con un abordaje por vía anterior. We need some translation, baby, on the loose She says that. Uh, the hip needs more uh, another operation uh, for an anterior approach to reduce the, the head into a, the acetabulum. Okay. We'll, we'll stop here. Again, you can't, a good pelvic or a femoral I hear somebody talking, could you mute your phone? 
esperando. Y Luis, me ha tratado otro también, es que no olvide. Por favor, apaguen los micrófonos. Hay alguien que está hablando con micrófono. Thank you. This would be the starting point next time. A good femoral osteotomy and a pelvic osteotomy will not substitute for a poor open reduction. And we'll start with this case next time and go through it. And you're absolutely right, Antonella, we need to start over. When we went in to redo this, the medial capsule, which I mentioned before and Jaime mentioned, had not been opened whatsoever. And I mean, to me, the most important thing of the open reduction is we talked about is do a good open reduction. You have to expose the capsule medially before you do your capsulotomy. And if you don't do that, you're going to be very frustrated how difficult it is to get the head medially and keep it there. So we'll go through that. And then we'll to tease people a little bit to go on. We'll get a little bit of older patient. And we'll go through some of the complications. And then we'll get to this here, which is the South American people said they want to talk to before. So we'll show this case here, not that case. Take your eyes off that picture. But we'll get to this here, and that's, and then we're going to get to this right here. So we'll start with this here. Now we get the five plus five year old. Okay, and what do we do for that? And then we've got the eight year old asymptomatic patient, a very good soccer player. What do we do for that? Whew. Then we've got this one here. She's the daughter of a cardiologist, honest to God. And when he ran with her, the only problem was she was towing in when she uh, ran. So talk, we'll talk about this one, Bibiana. Can you tell them next time around, we're gonna ask them about this one here. So we can stop here. And this is a tease, this is a preview for next time. Okay. So, vamos a, a concluir acá. Antonella, tenías toda la razón. Eh, lo más importante es eh, en la cadera que, que él te preguntaba, hacer una buena reducción y la llave está en la apertura capsular. Así que vamos a parar acá y todo lo que sea después de los ocho años, eh, él lo va a tratar en, en otro webinar. En el futuro. We'll try to get the same faculty together and we'll talk to everybody in a couple of months. We start again about what should we do for this eight year old boy who is one of the better soccer players on the team. And then this is the daughter of a girl who runs with her father. He's a cardiologist and he brought her in because she toes in when she runs. What should we do for this? And then. You and then close your eyes real quickly. And the last case we'll show is this one here. We'll show you this case right here. This is a 12 year old girl who comes in to see us. Close your eyes. She comes in from Central America and the hip hurts. And you guys wanted to talk about older hips. So what do we do for her? Go ahead, Bibiana. Well, uh, I, uh, I asked the people. Uh, no, this what is. Do, sorry, what? This is what we're going to show next time. I'm not just. Just I'm just trying to tell yes, them. Yes, yes, they know. They they know that uh, we can stop now. Yeah. And no, so right. this. Okay. Go ahead. You can say goodbye to the people if if we stop here. You want us to say goodbye, I think, so we'll say goodbye. <laughs> no, but uh, you know, you, you can st we can stop um, and share with, uh, with the guys in, in the third uh, webinar. So we stop and we thank everybody on the North American and the South American faculty and we thank everybody that helps so much get to talk together and thank you, Sabrina. So maybe we try to continue sometime later in the summer. Sabrina, ¿le quieres decir si él, eh, si él quiere mostrar este caso? Porque no quedó claro. Si lo quiere mostrar o quiere esperar, eh, no, esperar no, acá. Lo que está diciéndole a todos es que le estaba mostrando un poco como un preview de los casos que se vienen claro. para el próximo webinar. Así que en sí. breve les informaremos. Seguramente será el mes que viene eh, la fecha en que lo vamos a hacer. Perfect.
Perfecto. Chao, everyone. Perfecto. Chao, chao. Thank you all. Bye bye. See you. Gracias a todos por concurrir. Muchas gracias.